Good evening, students. Welcome to this session for paper three B, Goods and Services Tax. Today's topic is supply under GST. It is a core topic which has been continued from the previous session. In previous session held on thirty first January, we had uh, covered some portion of supply under GST. Now remaining portion we will be completing today. So let us start with the presentation. Yes. In previous session, what we had covered was the concept of supply under GST, its significance, and what are the important parameters for ascertaining that whether a given activity is supply or not. Now, so we had done in the previous class that supply should be supply of goods or supply of services. Supply should be for a consideration. And supply should be in course or furtherance of business. These three tests are required for ascertaining whether any activity, any transaction is a supply or not. We had gone in detail in each of these aspects, and then we had uh, as we have determined that whether, in case of absence of any of these, uh, you know, factors or any of these parameters, can we say any activity to be supply? So first was the business test, and in case we uh, we did a particular. Uh, Clause in Section Seven, which provided that in case of import of services, if import of service is for a consideration, then it can be uh, in course or furtherance of business or for personal purpose also. Then also it will be termed as supply. So this was an exception to the business test. We said if business test is not there, if any activity is not carried in course or furtherance of business, that activity will be considered will not be deemed as supply. But An exception has been provided in Section Seven, definition of supply itself, which says that in case of import of services, if it is imported for uh, consideration, then it can be without business purpose, and it can be uh, or it can be with business purpose. In both these cases, it will be considered as supply. So even if business test is absent, even if business test is not complied with, we in case of import of services for consideration, we say that it is a supply. Okay. You can keep asking your queries for the topic uh, in between the session. Okay, Kiran is telling without business purpose, but consideration it called supply. Yes, Kiran, you are right. So there we did the uh, exception to business purpose. Second is consideration. Now in that, in fact, in the previous class itself, we had done Schedule One, which provides the exception to the. Second test that is consideration. Just a minute. Yes. So we had done para one. It activities without schedule one says activities without consideration they are deemed as supply. Now there are certain activities which even though are uh, carried out without any consideration they are carried out free of cost but still they will be deemed as supply under GST law. This has been provided in Schedule One. In fact, when we are uh, when we are studying the definition of supply, along with Section Seven, we have to go through go through three schedules. Schedule One, which contains the concept of deemed supply. That means there are certain activities which we have deemed as supply. Second is Schedule Two, which concern which uh, provides a classification of activity uh, supplies, certain supplies as supply of goods or as supply of services. And third is Schedule Three, which contains the negative list of supplies. That means the activities which are listed in Schedule Three, they are neither supply of goods nor supply of services. So we'll be covering each of these schedules one by one. First of all, we are taking Schedule One, that is activities without consideration, which have been deemed as supply. Now it has four paragraphs or four entries in Schedule. We have four uh, entries in Schedule One. Para One we had discussed last time. That was. Permanent transfer or disposal of business assets where input tax credit has been availed on such assets. We'll uh, start from Schedule One itself, so we'll repeat Para One so that those students who are joining today they can at least understand it from this particular point. Before that, we'll take some queries if somebody has asked. Uh, Girish is saying real estate sector is out of GST, but construction of building is treated as supply of service. Yes, Girish, we'll do it once we are covering Schedule Two. You are right, but there is a small catch in that. 
So we will cover it in detail when we will be doing schedule two. What do we mean by consideration? Kajal is asking. Kajal, you have to watch the previous session for detailed elaboration on concept of consideration. Consideration is something which a person is paying, which a recipient is paying to the supplier for receiving any supply. It is also, uh, I'm just uh, giving you a summary. So sometimes you have given a deposit at the beginning of the uh, contract that you are saying that I will be, this is a security deposit and I will be taking it at the end of the contract. This is for the purpose of security. So that will not be consideration. Something which is being applied for the supply, which we have paid to the supplier as uh, in lieu of the supply, that is actually the consideration. Nagarjun is asking, uh, importation of service, whether or not in course of furtherance of business, is it supply? Yes, Nagarjun, you are right. Importation of services from relative also is, with consideration is also a supply. But you have to, in order to levy GST, we have to see certain other factors also. But yes, it is a supply. As if we see only till the concept of supply, yes, it is a supply. Somebody who has not attained the last lecture. So uh, after this session, you can attend that lecture. But in this session, I will try to cover as much points as I, as I can cover for those students also who are joining this session uh, in between. Schedule 3 is out of scope supply. Okay, So let us now begin with the concept of Schedule 1. So first is Para 1. I am repeating Para 1 for the benefit of those students who have joined just today. Para 1 says permanent transfer or disposal of business assets. Okay, Now it has three elements. First is that the, trans, uh, the disposal or transfer should be of business assets. Now what is a business asset? This has not been defined under GST law. But in the common parlance, what we understand from the term business assets is any tangible or intangible asset, any long-term or short-term asset of the business. Basically, it uh, signifies the capital goods, plant and machinery, furniture, equipments, which are owned by the business. Uh, as per the common understanding, it does not include stock in trade in GST. Because if it includes stock in trade within it, then everything will become a supply because any transaction made by a business without consideration, then that will be included in this. So generally, it does not include stock in trade, but any capital goods, any uh, assets in the nature of capital goods that will be included in the definition of business assets. Then the second condition is that this transfer or disposal should be in, should be of permanent nature. In last class, we had done the difference between transfer and disposal. Now transfer is actually we are shifting the possession of the goods from one person to another that is transfer but what is disposal we are getting away rid of the goods we are getting away from the goods either by way of selling them or we are scrapping the goods or we are donating the goods to some charitable organization or we are giving them free of cost to someone we are having consideration or not that is disposal transfer is only shifting of the possession so in disposal but here in case of para one if we want to include it in para one, because once we include any activity in para one, that becomes a supply, even if it is carried out without any cost, even if we have given some uh, goods without uh, any, without charging any consideration that becomes supply, if it is included in para one of schedule one. So para one says the transfer or disposal should be of permanent nature. We have permanently transferred the goods. We have permanently disposed of the business assets. Then the business assets, we have already seen what can be the possible meaning of business assets. And the ITC must have been availed on these business assets. Now, this is the most important condition. Only when at the time of purchase of these business assets, we had availed ITC on them, then only on the, we will say that when we are disposing them, then it is a supply, even if we have not charged anything from the recipient. Let us take an example. Dhruv gives old laptops being used in his business to his friend free of cost. Now, this will qualify as supply only if ITC has been availed by Dhruv at the time of purchase of these laptops. He purchased certain laptops for his business and then after some, after using it for one or two years, he uh, gave it to his friend. Now, permanently, he has given it to his friend. Not only, not for a uh, use for a particular time, we had, he has permanently transferred that laptop to his friend free of cost. So, he had not charged any consideration but still it will be deemed as supply in provided he has availed ITC at the time of purchase of the laptop, laptops because laptop is a business asset. At the time of purchase of laptops, he must have paid some GST on laptops and that 
he has availed as ITC, then he will be eligible for then it, th that supply or this transaction, this activity will be considered as supply or it will be deemed as supply. Though there is no consideration. So whenever we are think, we, whenever we have to um, determine that whether a particular transaction is supply or not, so we have always have to keep in mind consideration, business test, then supply should be of goods, services. All these things have to be collectively considered. But when we are uh, considering the items of Schedule 1 or the activities of Schedule 1, then this particular uh, condition has to be foregone condition of consideration. Second is a dealer of air conditioners permanently transfers the motor vehicle free of cost. Now, the dealer is of motor uh, of air conditioners. He has a business of air conditioners. He purchased a motor vehicle. But generally on motor vehicles, the uh, ITC is not available. ITC is blocked. Now, ITC related provisions we will do afterwards. So ju you just need to know that ITC has not been taken on motor vehicle. ITC was blocked on motor vehicle. Air conditioner dealer has taken that motor vehicle. Now he is selling that motor vehicle. So, and that motor vehicle he has transferred without any, without charging any consideration. So will it be deemed as supply? It will not be deemed as supply because ITC has not been taken on. Okay. So uh, the main condition is that ITC should have been taken on purchase of these assets. In case ITC has not been taken, there can be two cases. Either ITC was, ITC was not available at all. It was blocked on that particular purchase then uh, it can, it will not be considered as supply. Second case of not taking ITC could be that the registered person has willingly not taken the ITC. Though ITC was available, it has not availed the ITC for any purpose. Either it did not require that or its documents were not um, <clears throat> documents were not proper. It could not avail the ITC. So ITC was available, but it, not, it did not avail ITC. In that case also, if it is transferred, that business asset is transferred free of cost, then that will not be considered as supply because ITC was not taken at the time of purchase. Before moving to para 2, let us see if any queries there. If Dhruv purchase laptop for personal use, then there is no ITC, hence it is not a supply. Yes, Dhruv, uh, Ankur, you are right. That Dhruv has, but if Dhruv has purchased it for personal use, then definitely he cannot take ITC. There is no question of it being supply when it is transferring. Then when business has closed stock in trade, then what will we do with the ITC which has on which ITC has been taken? This is actually covered in schedule 2. We'll explain it at that point of time. I, the street is asking what is the meaning of ITC availment? ITC availment means that ITC was available on a particular uh, goods or services. At the time of purchase, we have taken the ITC. That means actually it is not said, it is not that when we are purchasing something, then ITC can be utilized only at the time of, um, ITC can be taken only at the time of selling the goods. No. Once you have purchased a particular product or service you have availed, then the input tax credit on the GST portion of that particular purchase can be taken in an account that is the uh, electronic credit ledger. You can take all the ITC in that particular account and afterwards you can utilize it as and when your output liability arises. So when I say IT, uh, ITC availment, that means ITC has been taken in the electronic cre credit ledger. Then it can be utilized afterwards. All three conditions are satisfied, then we deem as transfer. Uh, yes, Amman. If all three, these three conditions of para 1 are satisfied, then we will deem that particular transaction as supply even if consideration is not there. Furtherance of business. Furtherance of business. Uh, okay. Gunjan is asking, what do you mean by the furtherance of business? It means that the uh, any activity which is for the purpose of any advancement of business, which is in relation to business or which is for the purpose of any you know, improvement, any furtherance of the business. So anything in the, done in the interest of the business for promotion of the business or for the development or betterment of the business, that is also included in furtherance of the business. So in course of business means when you, you are doing it for the business purpose, for the furtherance of business means you are doing it for any purpose in relation to business for an advancement, improvement, promotion, that is the furtherance of business. Supply between, now para 2. Para 2 says supply between related persons or distinct persons. So supply of goods or services or both is considered as a deemed, is deemed as a supply 
even without consideration if such supply has taken place between a related person or between a distinct person now first of all in order to understand this para we need to understand the term related person and distinct person then this says that this uh, para says the this supply has to be made in course or furtherance of business okay otherwise also in schedule 1 wherever we are in all these three or four paras which are there in schedule 1 the basic premise is that the activities are carried out in course of furtherance of business even if it is not mentioned only thing which is absent is consideration activities have to be carried out in course or furtherance of business only so here it mentions para 2 says that supply of goods or services or both between related person there is a specific definition of related person in section 15 explanation and or between distinct persons as specified in section 25 section 25 is relating to registration procedure so whatever meaning or whatever persons have been specified as distinct persons in section 25 if any transaction is between them without consideration then that will be deemed as supply let us see what is the meaning of related person and what do we mean by the distinct persons under section 25 first of all we will see the related persons definition persons including legal person are deemed as related person if first such persons are officers or directors of one another's business for example a is the owner of a business and he is also a director in the business of b similarly b has his own business plus he is also an officer in a's business so the business or the uh, firms the uh, maybe we are considering it to be a proprietorship firm so the proprietorship form of a and b shall be deemed to be related okay second is such persons are legally recognized partners now there is a partnership firm abc and we have three partners a b and c so these three partners are related to each other they are related persons third example third is such persons are employer and employee so any business whatever employees it has they will be considered as related person to that business a company is there it has 1000 employees in it so all 1000 employees shall be considered as related person to that company fourth clause says a third person controls owns or holds directly or indirectly greater than or equal to 25% voting shares of both of them so at least 25% voting stock or shares of both these companies is owned directly or indirectly by a third person for example abc company has the abc limited has the shares of x limited 35% shares of x limited and 40% shares of y limited so this is abc limited which is having shares of both x limited as well as y limited so x and y will become related to each other next clause says one of them controls directly or indirectly the other now how can a one person control the other person there can be two ways first is either they have the at least 51 person one person if one person owns at least 51 percent shares of the other company or other in, uh, other business then that person shall be deemed to be controlling the other person or that person will be considered to be controlling the other person so for controlling any person any uh, business any enterprise any company at least 51 percent of the share holding is required second uh, a case could be that the uh, person that one company has the all the decision has a say in the decision making major decision making of the other company all policy decisions operate in the, all the operations quality control all the major decisions which are being taken in the other company they are taken only with the approval of the first company so that one uh, company will be considered to be controlling the other company so one of them controls the other that means a limited suppose a limited has 51% shares of b limited or a limited has 70% shares of b limited then a and b limited will be related to each other a limited will be controlling b limited and a and b limited will be related another case could be a limited has all the um, power to take the uh, all the power to take the decisions in b limited all the uh, major decisions the policy decisions then management decisions everything is in the hands of a limited then a limited would be 
कंसिडर टू बी कंट्रोलिंग बी लिमिटेड एंड ए लिमिटेड एंड बी लिमिटेड विल बी रिलेटेड नेक्स्ट इज अ थर्ड पर्सन कंट्रोल डायरेक्टली और इनडायरेक्टली बोथ ऑफ दम दैट मीन्स लाइक इन दर्लियर एग्जाम्पल वी हैड डन एबीसी लिमिटेड इट कंट्रोल्स ए एक्स लिमिटेड ऑल्सो एंड इट कंट्रोल्स वाई लिमिटेड ऑल्सो नाउ इन द प्रीवियस क्लॉज दिस फोर्थ क्लॉज इट इज मैंशन थर्ड पर्सन holds at least 25% of the voting share here the clause says a third person controls two entities now when when i say control uh, 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 two entities that means this control can be by way of the having a particular voting share in the in both these companies or it can be by having the, by controlling their decisions major policy decisions so if in these two companies are controlled by a third company then that these two companies which are being controlled they shall be deemed to be related so if abc limited is controlling x limited abc limited is controlling y limited then x limited and y limited shall be deemed to be related such person next clause says such persons together control directly or indirectly a third person now this is a vice versa case x limited controls abc limited and uh, when manner of control can be any either by voting share or by controlling its decisions similarly y limited also controls abc limited so x limited and y limited will be related okay then next clause says such persons are the members of the same family now what is a family we will see in the next slide but Uh, members of the same family are there and they are transacting any business then they shall be deemed to be related under gst law but when they will be considered as family that is important then only they become related so we'll see in the next slide what exactly the definition of family under gst law is because that is very important to understand this concept last is one of them is the sole agent or sole distributor or sole concessionaire of the other so if a sole selling agent is there of a company or a business then that person that will also be related to the business so this is the definition of the related person so any transaction any supply of goods or services between these persons shall be deemed to be a supply even if made without consideration in course or furtherance of business before moving further we'll take some queries hmm. so um Vishal is saying. Vishal is saying. Employer or company purchases laptop and giving to employee after some time permanent transfer to employee, then deemed supply. If what happened if ITC taken by the company? See, Vishal, if laptop is given to the employee, we have to see whether it is falling in para one or it is falling in para two. So in para one, if any business as it is given free of cost, but it is permanently transferred and ITC taken, then you need not establish this related person relationship also. this can be done this can be considered as supply in para one also but in case the uh, in case it is not a business asset suppose it's a stock in trade or the goods and services which a company is ordinarily supplying this is a laptop which a company has owned as a business asset so that cannot come in para two in para two we say supply of goods or services that means the goods or services which a company is supplying as a business if those services or goods it is supplying to a related person then that will be deemed as supply without consideration so in this case para 1 will apply the example which you have taken then nagarjun is saying para 2 up to 50000 is exempted that we will do nagarjun in the next slides jaspreet is saying 4.25% means collectively in both no 25% means So twenty five percent in each of them. Can control be in professional capacity also in fifth point control? If a company is controlling, if a person is controlling the other person, that has to be in the, uh, in professional capacity. I didn't understand what you mean to say that if you are an employee and you are controlling the decisions, that does not that is not included. Is employer paying salary to employee a supply? No, it is not a supply because it is specifically excluded. By way of Schedule Three, it is mentioned in Schedule Three, so that that is excluded here. That is excluded from there. But we will do it afterwards. How can they control indirectly? They can control indirectly through the. If we are saying that what percentage they are holding, so if they are holding it through some other company, that twenty five percent, that is indirect. 
if a person transfers his business furniture to his brother without consideration it comes under supply or not now it is a business furniture again it is not a uh, supply of goods or services so supply should be if, if we have to include something in para 2 that should be the person that should be the goods or services in which he's person that person is transacting or he is carrying on his business those goods and services if they are transferred to a related person they will be included in para 2 officers and directors point somebody wants to know again see such persons first clause says such persons are officers or directors of one another's business so i taken an example that suppose a has a business a has a proprietorship firm and in that b is an officer b is an employee or he is working there he is an officer there similarly b also has his own proprietorship firm and in which a is an officer so these two firms which a is having and the firm which b is owning these two proprietorship firms shall be related to each other employer provide employee provide services to employer is deemed as supply if employee is providing any services to employer under a contract of employment then that is treated separately let's not go into that we have just gone through the definition of related person now what happens to service uh, any supplies between them in specific cases we will do afterwards such person control together control a third person with example together control a third person such persons together control a third person that means if two persons or two or more persons two or more companies for example a limited and b limited they are controlling a third person that means they are controlling abc limited and in that case this a limited and b limited if they are controlling abc limited so a limited and b limited will be considered to be related let us move further otherwise we'll be stuck here now i said definition of family is family is also defined under the gst law and something which you understand by family may not be exactly what gst law means so as per the definition of family family includes the a person's uh, spouse and children plus the parents grandparents brothers and sisters of the person provided they are wholly or mainly dependent on said person so you can see the difference between first and second clause when we say a person's spouse or children they are considered as related even if they are not wholly or mainly dependent on that particular person they are anyhow considered as related to him so if mr a is there then mr a's spouse as well as his children will be related person to him or will be family for him this is actually the definition of family so they will be considered as family even if they are uh, not dependent on that particular person but if parents grandparents and brothers and sisters are there so his parents his grandparents and his brothers and sisters they shall be considered to be his family only when they are wholly or mainly dependent on him let us take an example for understanding this see the tukaram godbole is a businessman who lives with his family in nagpur maharashtra his family comprises of his father bajirao he is a retired person his mother kashi bai she is a housewife an elder brother champak and a younger sister madhvi his wife sanyukta who is a housewife and two children atmaram and sarojini so this is his family structure now certain information is given about each of them and then we will see who is related to tukaram and who is not so our main central character here is tukaram godbole and we have to determine which all members of his family are family as per the G definition of family under gst law tukaram is a manufacturer and supplier of toys in mumbai now first of all champak champak is a well settled interior decorator residing in california usa since last 5 years so i would um you consider to be related to tukaram or not champak is a well settled interior decorator who is residing in california since last 5 years so whether champak is related to tukaram or not i am expecting answers from all of you so 
in order to understand that whether you have understood the concept or not. Because we already, let us once again see the definition of supply. Spouse and children will be related to a person even if they are not dependent on him. They are independents. Then also we'll say that they are, they, they are his family. But parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters will be considered as related only and only when they are wholly or mainly they are dependent on that person financially. Okay. So Champak is a well-settled interior decorator. So Rituraj, you are right. Are they? Then, in fact, all of you are right. Are they Anandita, Tanishka, Sweetie, Sindhna Ben, and Diksha, Mayur, Ritu, Manish, Shankaran, Mayur? All of you are right that he is not related because he is well settled. He has his own business. He is not dependent on Tukaram for finances and therefore he is not related. Though he is his brother, any services which Tukaram will be providing to Champak free of cost or Champak will be providing to Tukaram free of cost, they will not be considered as, or any goods they will be supplying to each other, then they will not be considered as supply. So they need to have consideration, then only it will be considered as supply. Then Madhvi is financially wholly dependent on Tukaram. Now Madhuri, Madhvi is his sister. She is fully dependent on Tukaram. So will she be considered as his relative or not? Or will she be considered as his family or not? Yes, all of you are giving the right answers. In fact, all others have given the right answer. So this concept, family concept is I hope very clear to you. Regarding this Madhvi. So I'm getting the answers that Madhvi is related. Yes, you are right that Madhvi is not, uh, Madhvi is not independent. She is fully dependent on Tukaram. So therefore Madhvi is related to Tukaram. Okay. So Rahul, you're right. Kirti, Pradinya, all of you are right. Next is Sarojini. Sarojini registered under GST in Maharashtra is an independent director in a multinational company, Unicorn Technologies Limited, Delhi. Now, Sarojini is independent. Sarojini is not dependent on her father. Even if she was dependent, then also in both the cases, she will be considered as a relative. In fact, I have myself given the answer before waiting for you all. But all of you have given right answer for Madhvi. I have got so many answers from all of you. Um, Pavitra, Ritu, Vankur, Sweety, then Himlata, Anandita, Imani. All of you are right. So Raj, Aparna. Because um, regarding you are still answering for Madhvi. Madhvi is related because she is dependent on Tukar. I'm asking first. So I had given answer, but let's see. Uh, I had got answers from you, all of you also. You have already answered regarding Sarojini also that Sarojini is related because Saroj, in case of Sarojini, she is a uh, she is the daughter of Tukaram. So we had seen that for children as well as for spouse, there is no condition that that person should be dependent on the uh, de that should, person should be dependent financially. So since Sarojini, even, even though she is independent financially, she is not dependent on Tukaram, but she is the daughter of Tukaram. That is why she is related to Tukaram. Yes, all of you have answered it correctly. I'm happy to see that you have understood. Next is Atmaram. Now, Atma, uh, Divya, you are saying not related. So please mention the reason why you feel that it is not related so that we can understand that uh, what's there in your mind. Atmaram is a student of class 10th in Shik uh, Shiksha Senior Secondary School, Nagpur. Now, Atmaram is a student. He is son of Tukaram Godbole. Now, will he be related to Tukaram? And apart from that, we have to determine that whether his parents, Bajirao and Kashibai, as well as his wife, whether they are related to him or not. So, the... Yes, for Atmaram, also I'm getting <coughs> correct answer that yes, he is the... He is son of Mr. Tukaram. So, therefore, he is related. And he is actually dependent on him also because he is a student. So it is apparent that he is dependent on Tukaram. Otherwise also, even if he was independent, he would be considered as his related relative or his family. Now his parents, both of them we have seen that one, his father is retired, his mother is a housewife. So they are financially dependent on Mr. Tukaram. So that, uh, and now actually, I think you are all clear with the concept of family. So let us understand what his father, his parents and the status of his parents and his wife. So his parents will be considered as his family because they are dependent on him. Had they been independent, 
his father is engaged in any business or his mother is doing some uh, activity some he, she is providing some service or in business then she, they would be considered as they would not be considered as family but here since they are dependent on mr tukaram they are considered as his family his wife sayukta she is a housewife she is financially dependent on tukaram but even if she was independent because she is his wife so spouse and children there is no condition for being dependent on the person and they are considered as family even if they are independent so sayukta will be a related person or family of mr tukaram so the golden rule is that for spouse and children there is no condition they will always be considered as a family of the uh, person which we are uh, considering and for brother sisters parents and grandparents they will be considered as a family only when they are wholly or mainly dependent on such person okay so all of you are giving the right answers his parents are related because they are mainly dependent on him second is the concept of the distinct person so we have understood the related person then we have we understood the definition of family now we come to the definition of distinct persons or the concept of distinct persons distinct person has been defined under section 25 section 25 relates to registration so before understanding the concept of uh, this distinct persons let us first of all have a brief idea of registration provisions registration under gst has to be obtained only and only when a person has exceeded the threshold limit. there is a threshold limit which has which is prescribed for supplier of goods separate threshold for supplier of services and for supplier of goods and services both in different states depending on when, from which state you are supplying the goods and uh, what is your thresh what is your aggregate turnover is so once you are liable to register all these provisions you will be studying when you will be studying the chapter of registration so i'm not going into uh, detail for that you just need to know at this point of time is that in case a person has to obtain registration in any one state he, or he becomes liable to registration then he has to obtain registration in all the states from where he is making a taxable supply now mark these words taxable supply so in case he is making a uh, in case he is Uh, making a non taxable supply from any state so he is operating in four states and in one state he is make from one state he is making non taxable supply or he is making an exempt supply from that state so from that state he is not required to obtain registration from all other states he has to obtain registration so once he crosses the threshold limit once he becomes liable to registration in any one state across india uh, on the basis of his aggregate turnover then he has to obtain registration on pan india basis so gst in uh, and registration under gst is pan based so i have a pan i and a person under single pan might get registered in seven different states 10 different states so in all those states he has to obtain registration only thing is that in the state where he is making non taxable supply or exempt supply he is not required to register second thing a person has to obtain generally a person obtains single registration within each state so i am operating in 10 states one registration in each state i have 10 registrations within one state suppose i am having multiple places of business i have five offices in delhi so do i need to take five registrations do i need to take one registration or what is the provision regarding this so regarding this the provision is that a person can take only one registration regarding delhi regarding delhi for all these five offices out of these five offices you can have one main office one main principal uh, one principal place of business or one of the offices can be declared as principal place of business you can take registration on that and others can be declared as additional places of business so there will be only one registration in delhi however we, since i have five offices so i have an option that i can have more than one registration also in delhi so there is a possibility but generally one state one registration if i want to have more than one registration in a state because i have multiple places of business in a state then that option is also available so these are the registration provisions now on the basis of this what do we mean by distinct persons or what do we mean by the establishment of distinct persons which is given under section 25 section 25 says a distinct person as well as an establishment of distinct persons that are included under section 25 and if there is any supply between these two then that is considered as supply as per para 2 hmm? so distinct person first is that 
if there is a supply or sorry if there are two registrations of the same person within two different states or there are different registrations of a person within one state like we have seen we have seen that if i have five registrations in delhi i can have five registrations in delhi i can have three registrations two on the basis of the types of businesses which i have suppose i have a shoe business i have a toy business and a ready made garment in delhi so two offices pertain to ready made garments one factory is for toys and two uh, showrooms are for garments so then in that case we have we can have three different registrations on the basis of the type of business which we have so all garments business can have one registration one can be principal and one can be additional place so i can have three registration within delhi also five registrations also so any uh, so these two registered persons a person who has obtained a registration in one state and plus it has a registration in another state so these two registrations will be considered as distinct persons if that different registration is within same state then they will also be considered as distinct persons so two different registrations means dif distinct persons this registration can be within same state this registration can be in different states hope that is clear to you second is establishment so this is an example which we have for distinct persons i have a registered office in delhi and another registered branch office in west bengal so these are two different states both of them are both the offices are registered so they will be considered as distinct persons second is establishment of distinct persons now a person has one uh, registered establishment in a state and he has another establishment in any other state now that another establishment can be registered cannot be registered for example in this example a person has a restaurant in maharashtra and that is registered but it has a liquor shop in uttarakhand now you know that alcoholic liquor is outside the purview of gst so alcoholic liquor is non taxable good and since this person is making a non taxable supply from uttarakhand so he is not liable to take registration from uttarakhand we had already discussed that a person who is making a non taxable supply from any state in that particular state he can opt not to take registration so he has not taken registration because he is not required to pay any gst in uttarakhand it is not subject to gst liquor is not subject to gst so these two establishments are establishment of distinct persons so hope this concept of distinct person and establishment of distinct persons is clear to you any transfer between these distinct persons or establishment of distinct persons without consideration shall also qualify as supply now what type of transfers can be there there can be stock transfer branch transfer between these distinct persons stock transfer generally we have stock transfer because uh, suppose one is factory a, a person has a factory in state a and he has to sell those goods produced in that factory in five different states which where it it has its outlets depots or showrooms so it has to transfer its stock to all these states that is the stock transfer it can happen within one state also that i have a um, factory at location a in state and at location b i have to sell the goods so i have to transfer the goods from factory to the showroom to the depot there can be a possibility that in one showroom the uh, demand is very high of a particular product so it has to be shifted from all other showrooms to that particular outlet that particular depot uh, uh, showroom for sale so there can be such type of transfers between the distinct persons because somewhere demand is high or somewhere that that has to be uh, that has to be shown and that has to be sold there is a order specific order for a particular product at some place so that is the stock transfer so when this stock transfer will come, will become a supply and when it does not become a supply that is also we have to see through examples when there is a stock transfer or branch transfer between two different registrations mark my words registration i'm saying so then it will be deemed as supply or it will qualify as supply branch transfers are always without cost they are free of cost because when you are transferring your goods from one office to another one uh, factory to another factory or other outlet then obviously the uh, these there will be no cost that will be charged that, that will be free of cost but under gst if these two um, branches or head office or branch or the factory or the branch is registered they have separate registrations then that will be considered as supply or that will be deemed as supply for example in this 
example you can see i have a registered office i have a registered factory at lucknow my factory is registered at lucknow and i have a showroom at delhi which is also registered so these two are registered these two are in two different states also so they have to be registered so any transfer of stock between these two from factory something is going to showroom that will be deemed as supply no prices no uh, consideration is charged by lucknow from De uh, by lucknow to delhi but still that transfer will be deemed as supply in second example we are taking there are two uh, you know offices or two uh, registrations are uh, two uh, outlets are there in one state so in the state of uttar pradesh we have factory at lucknow and we have showroom at kanpur most important thing is that they are under single registration so we have obtained one registration in lucknow uh, uttar pradesh and we have two places two places of business stock is being transferred between them <clears throat> so will they be considered as supply no <coughs> they will not be considered as supply because these two outlets do not have a separate registration they have the same registration so uh, let's continue so these two businesses are under same registration uh, these two uh, yes they have same registration so they are they do not have any two different registrations so i already told you two registrations any transfer between them that will be considered as supply but if same registration any transfer between them with or without consideration uh, that will be considered that will not be considered as supply so here we are discussing the cases without consideration because it is para 2 of schedule 1 if you are transferring between two branches the both of them are under same registration then that will not be considered as supply so generally it will happen within same state only because if we are having two different states then they will be registered obviously so this is just a summary of what we have discussed suppose we have two place of business within a state we are assuming so whether establishments have same pan yes these two in this is the basic premise which we are having basic presumption that the two branch do the, the two establishments they have same pan now if they have separate registrations for two places of business no because they are in the same state then the transfer between them will not be considered as supply but if they have separate registration for two businesses within two place of business within the same state then the transfer between them will be considered as supply hope this is this stock transfer and branch transfer is clear to you let me see the queries and i will get an idea whether you are able to get through the concept or not ma'am on same place of business can we take multiple gst registered with different person or different pan if there are on a same premise that obviously it will be Uh, in a same building you can have different uh, places of business but they will be segregated because you are you are saying you are having different pan but for same pan and same premises you cannot take more than one registration so but you should have multiple places of business to take multiple registration if once registered gst not across limit still he pay gst yes if you are taking a voluntary registration kiran then also you have to pay gst in case you are your aggregate turnover has not exceeded but these all queries relate to registration so we we'll first of all focus on queries relating to supply ma'am if parents are receiving pension then they are dependent or not if parents are receiving pension they are not financially dependent on the person which uh, in our case mr tukaram so that is why we have mentioned if any they have any financial sources of income then they will not be considered as dependent on the person i have got all correct answers regarding the related person so i am happy that you are clear with that concept um is there any time limit for taking registration in same state on one pan number no there is no such time limit if uh, abhishek is saying if i have two registration in madhya pradesh so both registration is distinct even 
one is for principal place and another is for additional. Yes, you are right, Adishri. Manish is saying establishment one is not here. Establishment of distinct persons, Manish, means that one, uh, you have two establishments in two different states. One of them is registered. If you are transferring from one registered establishment to the another establishment, then that will be considered as uh, transfer or transaction between establishment of distinct persons. This another establishment can be registered or cannot be registered. We have taken an example where one place of business is a restaurant, other place of business is a liquor shop. Now, liquor shop is not registered because it is a non-taxable supply. So, if any transaction is, any uh, goods have transferred from Maharashtra, sorry, have transferred from the restaurant to liquor shop, then that will be considered, that will be considered as supply even if it is cons done without consideration. So, Rituraj, your answer question has also been answered. Then, uh, any business owned and registered by a person in stock transfer it been between them is considered as distinct person as a result being supply. Yes, Tanishka, right. Then, GST is taxable in supply amount. Gunjan is asking, ma'am, GST is taxable in supply amount. GST is payable or not, that we will see later on, but this these transactions are supply. Abdul is asking for Hindi uh, uh, to uh, discuss all these things in Hindi, all this discussion. I will, once I complete para 2, Abdul, I will have a brief a summary of the entire uh, para 2 in Hindi. Then I now every I am getting so many answers that you are clear with the concept which I have explained. Establishment of distinct person, I have once again explained. GST number is actually GST registration. When I say GST registration, two separate GST registrations, that means they have separate GST and GST number. Their GST number is separate. That is what GST registration means. Uh, can register multiple states with same PAN. Yes, you can register with, uh, that is what I was telling, that uh, registration under GST is PAN based. So I have same PAN, I am operating in 15 different states, 20 different states. I can obtain with this same PAN, I can obtain regist different registration numbers in different states. If I have a different registration number and any transaction is being carried out between them, then that transaction without consideration will also be considered to be a supply. If Delhi showroom is not registered, it will be an establishment of distinct persons. Sweetie, you are right. Transfer of stock to some expo. To some expo. I didn't get you, Kajal. Please repeat, uh, elaborate your query. Then, so now I hope you all, all are clear with this concept of stock transfer, branch transfer, distinct person, establishment of distinct persons. Okay. So any transfer, any tra uh, activity or transaction between them, that shall be deemed as supply. One more related person uh, is covered in this particular para 2. There is an exception actually, which says that any gifts which are supplied by an employer to which are give uh, which are given by an employer to an employee up to a value of 50,000, they are not considered as supply. This is an exception to this rule. Now, employer and employee are related that we had seen in the definition of related person that employer is related to employers. They both are related. So, if any gift has been given by the employer to the employee up to a value of 50,000 in a financial year, 50,000 per employee per financial year, then that will not be considered as supply. Now, before going into the details of this particular clause, we need to know one more thing that which is pertaining to Schedule 3. We will discuss in, it in detail there, but today we'll have an idea because this is important to understand the whole relationship of employer and employee and their taxability. Any service provided by an employee to an employer in course of employment or in relation to the employment is outside the scope of GST. That means that is not a supply. That is included in uh, Schedule 3. Schedule 3, I already discussed that it is a negative list of GST. It is the, the supplies mentioned in this list are not supply of goods. They are neither supply of goods nor supply of services. They are not supplies at all. So, in Schedule 3 specifically mentions that services provided by employee to employer in course of his employment. So, if somebody is an employee in a company, then he is providing services to that company because he is receiving salary in return. So, that salary is not a consideration or that salary, in fact, it is a consideration but it is not a supply. 
So person is the employee is receiving salary. It is providing services in return to employer. This transaction is not a supply. So employer and employee are the related persons. Employee, if any service employee is providing to employer in course of employment. So that is very important that he is an employee. He has a contract of employment. Contract says that these are the services employee has to provide to employer. And contract says that in return of those services, employer has to pay this, this, this amount or uh, these uh, perquisites to the employee. Then they will not be considered as service. Now, again, here para 2 says in this relationship of employer and employee, para 2 says that if any uh, employer is giving a gift to its employee up to a value of rupees 50,000 in a financial year, it is not a supply. Now, first of all, what do you mean by a gift? A gift is actually, uh, gift is actually a voluntary, uh, is voluntary uh, you know, provision of any service or any goods to a person. Generally, it is in the form of goods, but it can be in the form of services also. I am giving a gift to my employee. So it is my wish or it is the wish of the owner to give a gift to the employee or not. So it is voluntary in nature. Employee, employee cannot uh, seek it as a matter of right. Employee cannot sue the employer in court that you have not given me that particular gift. So I am going to sue you. I am going to take you to court. Because I am your employee, you are bound to give me any gift. No, that is not the case. So in, that is voluntary in nature. It cannot be it is not a right of the employee. So if something as a wish, the employer is very happy because of its uh, sales and during the past year and it is giving it, it's all its employees a particular gift then or all its employees in uh, a cash of 50,000, then that is a gift. That is a, in fact, gift can be in kind, gift can be in money. But here, the gift of, if, suppose uh, here what we are including particularly is Supply of goods or services. So that gift here has to be in the form of uh, kind or it, it, cannot, it cannot be in the form of money. Though employee employer can give cash prizes or cash gifts to its employees, but it will be deemed as supply only when that gift is a particular good or service. So if I am giving air conditioners to all my employees on the 25th anniversary of the company or completing 25 years, the company is giving... Um, company is giving... Uh, some you know, mo uh, mobile phones to the employees worth rupees 25,000, worth rupees 45,000, and that will not be considered as supply. But if its value exceeds 50,000, if the value is 50,000, one rupee, then that entire amount will become a supply. So employee, employer can give a gift to its employee in a financial year up to a value of rupees 50,000. If the value exceeds 50,000, then that particular gift will become a supply because it is a supply between related persons and it is, uh, though it is without consideration, it will be considered as supply, it will be deemed as supply. Okay. Now, in, uh, perquisites by employer to employee. Now, we said that anything which is given by employer to employee because of a contract of employment, he is my employee, that is why I, he is my employee, that is why I am giving him a membership of a club or I am giving him free food. So that will be, that is a perquisite which I am providing to the employee. So that will not be considered as a supply. Any perquisite provided by employer to its employee in terms of contractual agreements. And this is the most important, that it should be in terms of contractual agreement, it should not be uh, otherwise then of contractual. That means if he is my employee, that is why I am giving him this particular perquisite. Otherwise, he would not have been eligible for that. So contractual agreement entered into between employer and employee. And this uh, provision of perquisites is in lieu of the services provided by employee to the employer. So employee is providing services to employer. Employer is providing perquisites to the employee. This arrangement has been mentioned in the contract of uh, the appointment or the contract of employment between employer and employee. This is all about para 2. So para 2. Supply of goods or services between related persons or distinct persons as specified in section 25 in course or furtherance of business is considered as supply, even if the this supply is without consideration. Exception is supply by an employer, a gift by an employer to employee up to a value of rupees 50,000. With this, we come to an end of para 2. Hope it is clear to you.
video uh, somebody's writing video is not available please let me know if video is visible to you all live video is not available is it still not available so i will share it again please let me know and uh, i gift my employee exceeding 50000 then can i avail itc for itc payment you have separate provisions manohar you have to see them registration turnover limit abdul please uh, we will be discussing it afterwards because if we today start discussing it then our entire focus will be on registration provisions rather than supply once transaction becomes supply we need to charge gst rahul is asking no rahul once a transaction becomes supply it only means that it is a supply now we have to see other conditions that whether it because for charging gst there are other conditions we have to see and once it becomes chargeable to gst then we have to see yes if all these if a particular um, activity is supply then it becomes chargeable to gst but we have to see whether it is not exempted then who has to pay the tax there are so many things we have to see afterwards also which we'll be seeing in other chapters for the timing what we are doing is whether a particular transaction whether a particular activity is supply or not so uh, just please your query i think has answered if, if value is 50000 more than 50000 entire value becomes supply okay some students are saying that video is visible so i hope if view is aman is saying that video is unavailable so aman you have to see whether video is available or not but i think bus app has some problem uh kirti is asking ma'am can we avail voluntary registration in uttarakhand liquor shop yes kirti you can have uh, voluntary registration but i told you that voluntary registration if you take then you have to pay gst on that also then we come to para 3 before that i think all your queries have been answered see bus app is not showing the uh, video then he'll take he'll cut take care of that during the break i have to address that during the break so once we take the break i will see whether video is coming or why is it not coming you as i hope in on your uh, portal it is there in para 3 the principal agent relationship now para 3 of schedule 1 uh, says that if any goods are supplied by a principal to its agent then that will be considered as supply even if it is not if without if it is without even if it is without consideration so generally what happens principal gets their goods sold by an agent they cannot uh, approach the entire country on their own so at different places they have their agents and these agents sell goods for the principals so what they do is they sell these goods through these agents and first of all they have to supply these goods to these agent there can be other way or transaction that a principal has to get the buyers for their products so they can have agents uh, all over the country and these agents can get the buyers for their products so either they can sell their products uh, sorry uh, this is for the buyer second is uh, for the suppliers they want to have they want to procure goods from across the country so for that they can have the agents who will get them the sellers for their for the product they want to sell so it can be two way transaction principal supplies goods to agent and agent further sells it principal asks the agent to procure the goods which he wants to actually sell or which he wants to use in his manufacture so in that case also we can utilize the services of agent that he can uh, ask the agent to procure the goods from the uh, procure the goods from various parts of the country and give it to the principal now this agent is actually uh, whether an agent as per para 3 or not first of all we have to see because once a person is an agent as per para 3 there are specific conditions which a person an agent has to fulfill there are specific um, rider with the agent under para 3 which has to be fulfilled then only this principal agent relationship will be considered under para 3 so um, supply of goods and not supply of services is covered here second supply of goods between principal and agent without consideration is also supply so only supply of goods is covered supply of services is not covered here second thing is that by virtue of this paragraph or by virtue of para 3 if any goods are supplied by principal to agent obviously he will not charge anything from the agent but by virtue of this para 
the, this supply becomes shall be this activity shall be deemed as supply if any principal any agent is supplying any services for the principal then that will not be covered here so only supply of goods is covered here principal supplying any services to agent will not be covered here consideration even if it is not charged then also this transaction will be considered as supply let us understand that when an agent will be deemed to be an agent under para 3 of schedule 1 for this the condition is invoice now supplier or principal has supplied certain goods to agent it has given certain goods transferred some goods to agent and it has asked that agent to sell these goods in 10 different states now this transfer of goods by principal to agent will be considered as a supply only when this agent falls within the purview of para 3 now when this agent will fall within the purview of para 3 when he this agent issues an invoice for the further supply being made by him that means principal is making a supply to agent agent is making a supply to the customer so if by making the supply to the customer agent is issuing an invoice in his own name then this will be considered as an he will be considered as an agent under para 3 and this entire transaction will be covered under para 3 so in that case so there are two legs of a of this uh, transaction first is by principal to agent and then by agent to uh, recipient so if a agent is issuing invoice in his own name to the recipient then uh, agent is charging money from the recipient so that leg is obviously uh, supply because consideration is there it is in course of furtherance of business what is being covered in para 3 is supply by principal to agent because principal is giving uh, goods to agent without charging anything but if agent is issuing the invoice in his own name then the supply of goods by principal to agent will also become uh, a supply or it will also be deemed as supply. But where invoice is issued by the agent in the name of the principal. Now, what is this transaction? Uh, is Principal is giving goods to agent and agent is giving uh, or supplying that goods to the buyer. But invoice is being issued in the name of the principal. Invoice, uh, the agent is not issuing invoice in his own name then this relationship will not cover will not be covered under para 3 and transfer of goods by principal to agent will not be deemed as supply so the basic condition is that the agent has to issue an invoice in his own name to the buyer what is the basic condition invoice has to be issued by the agent in the name uh, uh, in his own name to the buyer if he is issuing invoice in the name of the principal then that will not be covered under para 3 so, um, I will take the queries after a while. First of all, let me cover um, para 3 completely. The afterwards, I will take the queries for para 2 and 3 simultaneously. So, um, so where an invoice is issued by agent in his own name, he is an agent under para 3. Where he is issuing an invoice in the name of the principal, then he is not an agent under para 3. And supply by principal to agent will not be a supply. We'll take some examples so that this can become clear to you. Unmole appoints Bolu to procure certain goods from market. Now, this is the other case. We have two cases where principal asks the supply, uh, agent to sell his goods uh, throughout the country. Other could be the principal asks agent to procure the goods from various parts of the country or various markets, selected markets. It could be from one market also. He's using um, that agent to procure the goods for him. So Anmol has appointed Bholu as his agent and he, Bholu has to get the goods or procure the goods from the market for Anmol. So Bholu has identified various sellers which can sell the goods to Anmol and he asked the supplier that is the Golu that means the ultimate supplier because in this case the he is getting the goods for Anmol. So he has asked the supplier to send the goods to Anmol and issue the invoice directly to Anmol. So, Bolu is not issuing the invoice in his own name. It is asking the supplier to issue the invoice in the name of the Anmol, in the name of Anmol. So, this is not a uh, transaction which is covered in Para 3. That means Bolu is not an agent as per Para 3. This transaction where Bolu is transferring goods to Anmol, he is procuring goods from Bolu and it is trans he is transferring it to Anmol. This transaction will not be covered under Para 3 
and it will not be deemed as supply because Bholu is not issuing an invoice to Anmol in his own name. He has to issue an invoice in his own name. Similarly, so second uh, example, Money Money Bank, a banking company appoints Mandar. He's an auctioneer to auction certain goods. Banks generally do this because they are certain, uh, sometimes somebody doesn't pay the installment. They give uh, certain goods on installment. So they take the goods from them. They have, they don't get money. So they get the goods from the person. So they have to auction certain goods. The auctioneer arranges for the auction and identifies the potential bidders. Now, when the highest bid is accepted and the goods are sold to the highest bid to the money, money bank, the invoice for the supply of the goods, because money, money bank has appointed Mandar as agent and Mandar has identified the potential bidders. Bidders are who? The bidders are the buyers of these goods. But the invoice has been issued by money, money bank and not by Mandar in his own name. So in this case also, Mandar is not an agent as per para 3. The transaction of auction by Money Money Bank to potential bidders is a supply transaction, but the transfer of goods by Money Money Bank to Mandar will not be the, will not be supply as per para 3 of schedule 1. Gautam, an artist, now he has, he uh, appoints Gambhir. He's an auctioneer to auction his paintings. Gambhir arranges for the auction and this is a similar transaction in fact. But in this, which we had done for the bank, now here uh, an artist has appointed the auctioneer for auctioning his paintings. This agent here, the Gautam is the, uh, sorry, Gambhir is the agent. Now what Gambhir is doing is, he is issuing an invoice in his own name to the bidders. So in this case, Gambhir is not merely providing the auctioneer services, but it is also supplying paintings on behalf of Gautam to the bidder. And therefore, the you hear Gautam, oh, sorry, here Gambhir is, or you can say agent, is an agent under uh, para 3 of schedule 1 because he is actually issuing invoice in his own name and not in the name of the artist that is Gautam. Main thing is that he has to invo issue invoice in his own name. Same, same as this example also that a clearing and forwarding agent or a commission agent take possession of the goods from principal. So principal has given his goods to his commission agent or to his clearing and forwarding agent. And he issues the invoice in his own name. So uh, who is issuing invoice? The clearing and forwarding agent is issuing invoice in his own name. So in this case also, he will be an agent as per para 3 of schedule 1. And any transfer by the principal or supplier to the agent shall be considered as supply. Now with this, this para 3 basic concept we have understood. In this, we have a clarification regarding Dell Credit Agent. So I hope this agent and principal concept is clear to you. Let me see your doubts and your response so that I can understand that, yes, you are clear with that concept. Okay. Can you show the, uh, can you explain the purpose? Anishka is asking, perquisites by employer to employee. Anishka, employer to employee is uh, the, any perquisites. Suppose employer is providing any perquisites to the employee. In uh, pursuance of the contractual arrangement of employment. Mr. A is an employee of ABC Limited and because of that ABC Limited has provided him membership for a club. It has provided him free food in the canteen. Then it has provided um, Mr. A car also for commutation. So all these perquisites which ABC Limited is providing to Mr. A is because Mr. A is an employee of ABC Limited. It is by virtue of the contractual agreement between the two. His con his appointment letter or his contract, uh, this uh, employment letter, it says that these are the perquisites which ABC Limited will provide to Mr. A. So all these perquisites will not be considered. The provision of these perquisites by company to Mr. A, by ABC Limited to Mr. A, will not be considered as supply because they are in the nature of contractual agree uh, contractual agreement of employment or they are by nature of in the uh, in course of employment because mr a is an employee he is getting all these services or all these facilities so these perquisites will not be considered as supply here i am actually mixing schedule 3 with schedule 1 so this we will do when we will do schedule 3 also but it is important to understand it at this point of time also otherwise we will not have a in, uh, holistic picture of the employer-employee relationship for the purpose of supply. 
So employer, if anything employer is providing to employee by way of the contractual agreement of employment or by way of employment uh, in simple words, since he is an employee, he is getting something from employer, it is not a supply. If it is as a gift, then we have seen that up to 50,000, it is not uh, a supply, but after 50,000, it becomes a supply. Okay, if BOS app is not showing the video, then we'll see this problem in the break and that will be taken care of. Narayanan is asking between employer and employee relation, tax and income from salaries or in GST also charge. Or in, yes, there is a in employer employee relation. See, under income tax, though, definitely salary income is taxable. But under GST, this is the difference that it is not considered as supply. The salary, in, the salary provided by employer to employee is not a supply or is not subject to GST under GST law. But under income tax law, definitely it is uh, taxable. Agent issues invoice in principal name, no supply. If issues in his own name, it is supply. Just treat your right. Consigner and consignee Neha will be considered under para 3 if they are in the, if any name you can give to agent. Agent can be given any name. Consignee is somebody who is taking the consignment. Agent is actually not a consignee. Agent is who is further selling your goods. So if you actually, if consignee is also acting in the nature of agent or he is um, discharging the same functions as an agent, he is supplying invoice and he is issuing invoice in his own name, then because agent can be whatever name you give to that person, he should in issue invoice in his own name and he should make further supply on behalf of the principal, then para 3 will be attracted. Ashok, your chat is reaching me. If you have any query, please uh, put it again so that it can come in fresh chat. Ma'am, seller, Neha is asking, seller is called principal and buyer called agent. Generally, seller is called principal because principal and agent means that there can be other, there, it can be other way also. Prince, a person can appoint an agent for procuring goods also. So if a person has appointed agent for procuring goods, in that case, he becomes a buyer. He has to, uh, the agent has to identify sellers for him. Then he becomes a buyer. So principal has either he has to supply goods through agent or he has to procure goods through agent. Uh, employer give a gift on birthday, etc. Then accept. Vishali is asking, if employer gives gift to employee on any occasion, anything, if he is giving gift to employee, that will be covered in para to accordingly. If employer transfers some goods to his employee, neither in the form of gift nor contractually, then para 2 will be attracted. If he transfers goods by some other form, if it is not in course or furtherance of employment, if it is not in course of employment and it is not a gift also, then this will be taxable. And this has to be, he is giving the gift without any cost. Actually, if your employer is giving anything to employee, then that will be a kind of gift only. Na? Otherwise, he will take some services from that particular person. Then he will become a normal uh, service receive, uh, service provider to him. Because if employer is giving something to employee, then he must be receiving something from employee also. Uh, that is why he is providing something to it. But yes, if it is not a gift and it is not in uh, course of employment, then this will be outside parity. If laptop gives as employment term, then not supply. If it is given in course of employment, that means by as a term of employment, then that will not be a supply. If employer gives 45,000 to employees, yes, then it, that will not be a supply. How can gift be a supply when gift is not related to business? See, Abdul, gift is also related to business only. It is only for the uh, purpose of business. We, when we are hiring the employees, we are hiring, hiring the employees only for the purpose of business. Na? Because we have to, our business is carried out by the employees. So if I am giving any uh, gift to my employees, it is in course or furtherance of business only. That cannot be said to be outside the business. They are my employees because they are carrying my business. So 
I have hired these employees in course of in course of business only, and therefore any gift given to them shall be in course of furtherance of business. Any pers if any individual is giving some gift to his employee in personal capacity because he is his friend, then that can be that may be outside. Then we come to the Dell Credit Agent. Now Dell Credit Agent because I want to complete uh, Schedule One before break. Dell Credit Agent is an agent where uh, who promises the principal that he will be uh, that he will be uh, he, in fact he guarantees the recovery of the consideration from the buyer. Suppose the, the principal has sold the goods for rupees thousand to agent. Then this, if he is a Dell Credit agent, then he will ensure or he will give insurance to the principal that yes, this entire one thousand rupees you will be getting from the buyer. And in case the buyer doesn't give it, Dell Credit agent will himself pay that consideration. And because of this feature only, Dell Credit agent generally charges high amount or high commission from the principals. So a Dell Credit agent is an agent. Who guarantees the payment to the supplier that whatever payment is due from the recipient from the buyer, the supplier will duly receive that payment. That is what the Dell Credit Agent is. Now, Dell Credit Agent, whether he falls within the ambit of Para Three or not, it again depends whether Dell Credit Agent issues invoice in his own name or not. So, the test for uh, ensuring or ascertaining whether Dell Credit Agent is an agent under Para Three or not remains the same. As for any other agent, that if he issues invoice under the uh, in his own name, then he is an agent. If he issues invoice in the name of the principal, then he is not an agent under Para Three. Now we come to the um, so this is clear that Dell Credit agent uh, ensures payment to the supplier. Now how he ensures payment to supplier is also an important point. That what he does is he. Gives some short term credit to his recipients or buyers. He pay makes the payment on their behalf, and he gives them a loan or you can say a credit of a short duration with some interest also because obviously he will charge interest. He will also have he cannot give them money free of cost just to uh, uh, ensure that supplier is getting his money. So he uh, gives money to supplier on the due date, and on that date he gives a credit to this buyer. For a short duration, charging some interest. So this is how this whole uh, situation works, or this whole scheme works. Now, how whether this will be a supply or not that we have to see. So suppose Dell Credit Agent is not an agent as per Para Three. Then the doubt which arose was that whether the temporary short term transaction based loan extended by the Dell Credit Agent to buyer for which he is charging an uh, interest will that be included in the value? Supplied by the principal to the buyer, because for that let us see this example. Suppose the principal is supplying to the now. In this case, we are assuming that Dell Credit Agent is not an agent as per Para Three. That means invoice is issued by the supplier to the recipient. Invoice invoice is not issued by the invoice is not issued by the Dell Credit Agent to the recipient. So this principal is issuing invoice to the supplier uh, to the recipient. And Dell Credit Agent is extending a loan to the recipient for ensuring the payment to the principal. Dell Credit Agent is providing agency services. So here, when Dell Credit Agent is not an agent as per Para Three, three services or three transactions are being taken place. First is supply of goods by principal to recipient because Dell Credit Agent is not an agent as per Para Three. So any transaction uh, supply of goods by principal to Dell Credit Agent and by Dell Credit Agent to recipient will be only one transaction, and that will be supply of goods by supplier to recipient because supplier is issuing the invoice and not the Dell Credit Agent. Second, Dell Credit Agent is an agent of uh, principal, so he is providing agency services to the principal. Third. He is extending a short term loan to recipient because he has to ensure the payment by recipient. So this is the third service which is being undertaken. First, the supply of goods by supplier to recipient, agency services by Dell Credit Agent to principal, and loan services by Dell Credit Agent to recipient. Now, how will this transaction work? Supply of goods from principal to recipient will be a supply. Agency services by Dell Credit Agent to principal because it is for consideration. He is receiving consideration for his agency services. This will also be a supply. 
supply goods supplied by principal to del credit agent will not be a supply because it is not a he is not an agent as per para 3 this extension of loan service will become a separate service because del credit agent is actually not providing any uh, goods to recipient it is the supplier who is or it is the principal who is supplying goods to recipient so this loan services will be taxable as a separate service because extending loan is a service or is a supply and recipient will be providing interest in lieu of this so all conditions in course of business then consideration all these uh, and service it should be a service so all these conditions are satisfied so extension of loan is a service which is provided by del credit agent to recipient and this will also be a supply so here there will be three transactions first goods supplied by principal to recipient del credit agent, agent is not in picture because he is not an agent as per para 3 agency services provided by del credit agent to principal and the loan services by del credit agent to recipient the del credit agent is not an agent second case is where del credit agent is an agent then what happens in that case because del credit agent is issuing an invoice to the recipient in his own name so in the first in respect of goods itself there are two transactions supply of goods by principal to del credit agent then supply of goods by del credit agent to recipient two transactions will become this first leg that is supply of goods by principal to del credit agent though it was without consideration but it was deemed as a supply by para 3 of schedule 1 hope this is clear to you second supply transaction that is by del credit agent to recipient it is by way of uh, recipient is uh, giving consideration to del credit agent and he is supplying goods this is a normal supply transaction so these are two transactions third transaction agency services provided by del credit agent to principal that was there earlier also this is the simple transaction for consideration agency services are provided by del credit agent to principal fourth transaction del credit agent is providing loan services to recipient here also but in this case this loan service will be clubbed in the supply of goods service this is called the concept of composite supply we will be discussing the concept of composite supply in the next class because we will not be able to cover it today. Just to give you an idea, sometimes it so happens that two supplies are naturally bundled in course of business. They are normally provided along with one service is provided as an ancillary service or as an essential service to the first service. So they become one or they are considered as a single supply and the rate which is applied is the rate of the principal supply which has the essential character of the transaction. Here the what you can see the main supply. Here the main supply is supply of goods. The del credit agent has to supply goods to recipient because uh, for ensuring that he receives payment on time, he has given this loan service also to recipient. So this is an ancillary service which he has provided along with supply of goods. So this he will be in this value of loan service will be included in the value of supply of goods. Here it is being included in the value of supply of goods by virtue of section 15 also. Section 15 has a specific provision that any um, this uh, any this uh, loan which has been or any interest which has been given by the recipient to the supplier that will be included in the value. So this supply of goods shall include the loan value of the loan or the interest charged from the loan by the del credit agent. So these four transactions I hope clear. Supply of goods by principal to del credit agent, it is a supply. Then by de uh, del credit agent to recipient, that will also be a supply. Agency services will also be a supply. And extension of loan services, its value will be included in supply of goods. Then there is a clarification on sales promotion schemes. Uh, this we will do afterwards when we, once we do the composite supply because you will be understanding it in a better manner after that. We will come back to this slide or I will include this slide in the next class. Para 4 says, para 4 of schedule 1. So with this, we come to an end to para 3. So any queries, please let me know. Asuk is asking a query before that I'm taking the query. It has been seen that large companies give foreign trips as gifts to their dealers. Is it a supply and a GST or not? So if it is a gift, Ashok, you have to see its value. And if it is more than 50,000, then definitely it will become a supply. You have to see its value. 
composite supply we'll discuss in next class i have just given you an idea because but i will take all the examples where composite supply is uh, applied in the next class also supply of material now everybody is asking about composite supply only then abdul is asking theory uh, ratio of theory and practical abdul i told you in first class there is a skill wise weightage which is provided on the website so that will give you an idea of theory and practical ratio loan will be added on interest or both will be added with supply loan will be no no uh, uh, raj loan amount will not be added to the supply only the interest amount will be added to the supply so here when i say supply of goods plus the interest which has been received on loan that will be added to the value of goods which has been supplied by del credit agent to recipient para 4 para 4 is importation of services now if any services are imported by a person from a related person or from his establishments located outside india person is receiving service from his related person we saw the definition of related person just few uh, slides back And, or he has received service imported services from his establishments located outside india so this person has some establishments outside india his associated enterprises or some other establishment it has received services from that establishment without consideration in course of furtherance of business that will be considered as supply let us consider exam an example you will be able to understand it better jumru associates receive legal consultancy services from its head office located in malaysia it is an establishment of jumru associated outside india head office has rendered such services free of cost since jumru associates and head office are related persons so services provided by jumru uh, received by jumru from its head office will be considered as supply even though head office has not charged anything from jumru because it is by virtue of para 4 that they have been deemed as supply champaka proprietor registered in delhi has sought architect services from his son located in india with respect to his newly constructed house now what are the conditions you have to fulfill it should be an import of service it should be from a related person it should be without consideration and it should be in course or furtherance of business now here champak has imported services that is fine he has uh, imported services from his related person because his son has provided the services so we had seen in the definition of family that son uh, will be considered as family whether he is independent or he is dependent so his son will be his related person then uh, the next is without consideration the son has not charged anything from champak fourth is in course or furtherance of business now this service which champak is receiving is for his newly constructed house so it is no way related to his business it is related to his personal uh, or his house so it is related to his personal purpose so this will not be considered as supply because one of the conditions is not fulfilled so all the conditions have to be fulfilled for this this is an overview of import of services if we are importing services without consideration then we have just seen that it should be a related person it should be in course or furtherance of business then only it will be a supply otherwise it will not be a supply if it is with consideration then it is in course or furtherance of business or not it can be that we had done in the last class that import of services with consideration can be in uh, with business in for the purpose of business or for the personal purposes in both these cases it will be considered as supply now we come to schedule 2 so we'll take a break quick break uh, but before that let me see some queries if are uh, there so that uh, we completing before break all the queries also shrinivasan is saying something to the uh, regarding the dca slide so in the slide it should be supplier to dca uh, Shrinivas, I am not able to get what you want to say. Please reframe your query. Supply of material along with transportation composite supply will not be taken. Uh, please help with quiz related on para three in module. Please, uh, Yashwini, uh, provide that uh, you mentioned that quiz also here in uh, in your query. Transfer from DC is also considered supply when it is considered from para three. Transfer from DC is also considered as yes. In the goods which are transferred by DCA to recipient. Will be a supply, but this this is for a consideration. So it is not under para three. Under para three, supply of goods by prince from principal to DCA will be a supply. In loan services, whether DCA give any money regarding loan services, DCA uh, in loan services, DCA will give money to the 
will give a credit to the recipient. That means he can give that amount which he has to pay to the DCA or the Dell Credit Agent. He can pay that amount. Recipient can pay the, that amount afterwards also. He has given him leverage that you can pay this amount after some time. That is not an issue, but you have to pay it with interest. So DCA has actually not given any money to recipient. He has given him a credit. He has given him a, a time um, span that yes, you, after this much particular time, you can pay this amount to me, but along with some interest. Stock transfer within same state if separate registration. Yes, it is a supply, Kiran. Krunal, Krunal is saying, please be, be a bit slow. Krunal, actually, I'm answering the queries. That is why I'm a bit fast because the person who is answering the query is attentive and he can understand. Um, DCA ka concept Hindi mein bachche samajhna chate. DCA ka concept Dell Credit Agent ka kya hai ki Dell Credit Agent ek aisa agent hai jo apne, jo jahan pe prom, uh, जो प्रिंसिपल को ये प्रॉमिस करता है कि आपका जो भी कंसिडरेशन है जो रिसीपेंट से आपको मिलना है वो इंश्योर करता है प्रिंसिपल को कि अगर रिसीपेंट नहीं देगा तो वो पैसे मैं आपको दूं यानी अगर आपकी कंसिडरेशन थाउजेंड रुपीज की है तो आपका डेल क्रेडिट एजेंट आपको पूरे थाउजेंड रुपीज पे कर देगा टाइम पर अब डेल क्रेडिट एजेंट वो रिसीपेंट से कैसे लेगा वो उसकी हेडेक है इसीलिए वो थोड़ा सा एक्स्ट्रा कमीशन भी चार्ज करते हैं डेल क्रेडिट एजेंट अगर एजेंट होगा या नहीं होगा इसके लिए आपको नॉर्मल कंडीशन देखनी है कि वो इन्वॉइस अपने नाम पर इशू कर रहा है या वो इन्वॉइस सप्लायर के नाम प्रिंसिपल के नाम पे इशू कर रहा है तो अगर वो इन्वॉइस अपने नाम पे इशू कर रहा है तो वो एजेंट है अब अगर वो एजेंट है तो उसकी क्या ट्रांजेक्शन हो रही है उसकी चार ट्रांजेक्शन उस केस में होंगी पहला तो जो प्रिंसिपल ने गुड्स सप्लायर एजेंट को दिए वो एक सप्लाई हो जाएगी दैट विल बी अ डीम्ड सप्लाई वो डीम्ड सप्लाई है पैरा थ्री में बिकॉज ये एजेंट हो चुका है अब ये डेल क्रेडर एजेंट एक एजेंट है क्योंकि ये खुद से इन्वॉइस इश्यू करता है अपने नाम पे दूसरी ट्रांजेक्शन होगी जो डेल क्रेडर एजेंट रिसिपियंट को गुड्स सप्लाई कर रहा है ये एक नॉर्मल सप्लाई ट्रांजेक्शन है जहां पर रिसिपियंट उसको कंसिडरेशन देता है वो रिसिपियंट को गुड्स दे देता है तीसरी सप्लाई होगी जो डेल क्रेडर एजेंट एजेंसी सर्विसेस दे रहा है प्रिंसिपल को और प्रिंसिपल उसके बदले उसे कमीशन दे रहा है ये भी एक नॉर्मल सप्लाई ट्रांजेक्शन है कंसिडरेशन है इन कोर्स ऑफ फर्दरेंस ऑफ बिजनेस सब कुछ है फोर्थ ट्रांजेक्शन है डेल क्रेडर एजेंट जो लोन एक्सटेंड कर रहा है रिसीपेंट को क्योंकि वो रिसीपेंट को कुछ टाइम दे रहा है अगर रिसीपेंट टाइम से पेमेंट नहीं करता या पेमेंट मुझे थोड़े टाइम बाद भी कर सकते हो लेकिन उसके लिए आपको इंटरेस्ट देना पड़ेगा वो इंटरेस्ट जो है आपका जो मेन सप्लाई ट्रांजेक्शन थी डेल क्रेडर एजेंट की रिसीपेंट को ये उसके अंदर एड हो जाएगी इस इंटरेस्ट की वैल्यू तो ये चार ट्रांजेक्शन इस तरह से टैक्स होती है इसके अंदर सो Now we'll take a break, and after the break we'll uh, cover schedule two. Let's have a break.
वेलकम बैक स्टूडेंट्स सो लेट अस कंटिन्यू विद शेड्यूल टू टू सो टुडे वी हैव कवर्ड शेड्यूल वन फोर पैराज ऑफ शेड्यूल वन बिफोर ब्रेक एंड यश रिगार्डिंग पैरा थ्री यशनी हैज आस अबाउट दी क्विज क्वेश्चन व्हिच इज प्रोवाइडेड इन योर स्टडी मटेरियल ऑन पेज नंबर 2.42 व्हिच सेज व्हिच इज रिगार्डिंग डेल क्रेडर एजेंट ओनली सो आई विल क्विकली कवर दैट क्विज सो दैट वी आर नॉट लेफ्ट विद दी टॉपिक this quiz this quiz question says that mr hensum is a dell credit agent now he has provided uh, dell credit agent services to charm limited and for this he has uh, issued invoice in his own name so that means he is an agent under para 3 therefore he uh, will be and whatever short term credit services he would be uh, giving to the recipients or to the buyers will be included in the value of supply of goods that is clear now here the value of goods which has been supplied is given as rupees 280000 and the interest on the same which is earned by the del credit agent is 20000 so the value of supply will together become 3 lakh rupees 2 lakh 80000 plus 20000 that is the value of supply of goods to the customers by del credit agent to the customers second is value of agency services now value of agency services will be simple the commission which has been charged by the charm uh, by the uh, del credit agent from the charm limited or from the company so that will be 30000 so answer will be option c here 3 lakh will be the value of goods and 30000 will be the commission uh, will be the value of supply of agency services that is the commission which has been charged by the del credit agent so hope this answers your query uh, query yashwini now uh, the schedule 2 so before this at the beginning of the session itself i told you that session 2 has the activities which are treat, uh, which are considered or classified either as supply of goods or as supply of services so that means it becomes very important that these uh, activities or transactions should be sh should be a supply first because they are not uh, including something into the definition of supply they are not considering anything to be supply no they are actually classifying a particular supply transaction into supply of goods or supply of services because now these all uh, entries which are there or these paras which are there in schedule 2 are generally those uh, services or those goods which were under controversy or which were con uh, which were debatable before the gst regime there was an issue or there was a doubt in the mind that whether they will be considered as supply of goods or they will be considered as supply of services so under gst regime in order to avoid any confusion any litigation these transactions have been clearly segregated either as supply of goods or as supply of services so that they can be gst can be levied on them because gst is a tax which is to be levied on both supply of goods as well as on services so this classification has been provided by the law itself in schedule 2 but that is very important that first of all an activity has to be supply first then it can be classified as goods or as services so let us go through each and every para one by one quickly and we'll cover schedule 2 in schedule 2 para 1 says that the transfer of ownership of uh, goods any transfer of title in the goods is a supply of goods if you are transferring the title title is the ownership so for example a car owner is transferring the ownership of his car to the recipient he is selling that car to the recipient and he is giving the ownership to the recipient from the date of sale that becomes a supply of goods so it is covered in para 1a para 1 clause a of schedule 2 that has classified this transaction as supply of goods so any transfer of ownership it is supply of goods then we have para 1b that means para 1 clause b says any transfer of right in the goods now here we are not talking about title we are not transferring the title actually so if only right in goods or right of undivided share in goods is transferred without any transfer of the title thereof that means ownership has not transferred only the right to use the goods has been transferred then that is a supply of services so please keep in mind that these transactions these activities are a supply and because they have been they are already a supply we are considering their classification so any transfer of right in the goods is a supply of service it is not a supply of goods so th though we are giving goods to the recipient but we are actually not transferring the ownership in para 1 what was there 
in para 1a we were transferring the ownership in the goods so that is why it was considered as supply of goods but in para 2 we are not transferring the ownership we are not transferring the title of the goods only the right to use those goods has been transferred so it is a supply of service so a car owner has rented his car for use for two days to a recipient and that car has to be returned after a uh, two days time so that will be only a right to use in car has been transferred and it is a supply of service. We have given a car on rent. Schedule 2, Para 1C. In Para C, it is given that any transfer of title in goods under an agreement which stipulates that property in goods shall pass at a future date upon payment of full consideration as agreed is a supply of goods. So here also the ownership is transferring. But the catch here is that ownership is not transferring on the date when the goods are being, possession of the goods is being transferred. Under a normal sale transaction, what happens? I sold the goods, I gave the possession to the, uh, to the recipient and I take the consideration. In this case, in um, the transaction which is covered in Para 1C is that where we are transferring the ownership only at a future date. Trans the property in goods will be uh, transferred at a future date only when the payment of full consideration has been made. Okay, So only when uh, the recipient will make full payment to car owner, then only the ownership of this car will transfer to recipient. But he can use that car till that time. So car is given to the recipient under an agreement. Payment of car has to be received in 20 installments. So that person can pay the installments in 20, that pay the consideration in 20 installments. So after that 20th installment has been paid, the ownership of the car can be transferred to recipient or it shall pass to the recipient. So in a higher purchase, this can be an installment purchase or a higher purchase transaction where the ownership shall pass or passes only at the end of the uh, only when full transaction has been, full consideration has been received by the supplier from the recipient, that transaction is covered. So ownership is not transferred on the date of sale. It is transferred when entire consideration, which was being generally it is in the form of installments or higher purchase has been received or a sale purchase on a, on a sale or return basis. Suppose you have given some goods to a person and you have said that you see these goods, you check them properly. And if you feel like buying them, you let me know. So when that sale transaction materializes, so transfer goods have been transferred today, but they will be, uh, but the property in goods will transfer only when that consideration will be received by the supplier. So that supply transaction is supply of goods. Then we come to schedule two para two para two a para two has actually the lease or licensing of land and building. Para 2A is regarding land and Para 2B is regarding the Para 2B is regarding the uh, building. Uh, Manish has asked with that why we are referring to the entries in these schedules as Para. Manish, this is how the law has, uh, you know, the nomenclature which law has given to these schedules that whatever entries are there in these schedules, they are referred as Paras. Whenever any change is made by the Finance Act or any constitution, any CGST Amendment Act or IG, uh, by CGST Amendment Act in these schedules, it is always referred as paras of the schedules. So that is why I'm referring it as para. You, for your sake of convenience, you can refer them as entries also, but they are actually para. So they are entries. I think uh, I had given you a list of uh, schedule two. There you can see that. Yes. So this is. Uh, this is para 1 which refers to transfer and these are three clauses of this para. Then the second para is land and building and these are the two clauses of uh, this para 2. Lease tenancy easement license to occupy land and then clause 2 says lease or letting out of building including a commercial or industrial residential complex for business or commerce fully or partly. In fact, if you see para, this is para 2. So para 2 has two clauses. One pertains to land, second pertains to building. But what they actually wishes to convey is that in first clause, we are actually giving the land on uh, rent. Lease is for a longer term. Tenancy is uh, renting for a smaller term. Then 
the easement easement is you are using someone's property but you are not actually having the possession just for a small period you are using it and then you are coming back or you can have an officially license to occupy the land so that is the lease tenancy or leasement or license to occupy land that is a service if you are having this you are renting a land then it is a service if you are renting or letting out a building now that building can be a commercial let's go to that particular clause only if you are renting a yes lease tenancy easement or license of a land is a service is a supply of service similarly letting or lease out of business uh, of uh, of a commercial building for a business or commerce or for a residential building for the purpose of business or commerce that will be considered as service so if you are renting out your building either for commercial purpose or for residential purpose that will be considered as a service but that should be for the purpose of business or commerce then para 3 para 3 is refers to job work any treatment or process which is applied to another person's goods is a supply of service now job work is goods this treatment or process which one person is applying to another person's goods is actually a job work a uh, job work is a very common practice in the manufacturing industry for example car manufacturing so car the body of the car is manufactured by one person then <laughs> tires are and tires are sometimes manufactured by other person or painting is done by a third person so these are the job workers who are actually carrying out a process on another person's goods a car manufacturer is there he has uh, he has manufactured the uh, the body of the car then painting is done by some other person he has sent the uh, the chassis or the body of the car to some uh, outside person he is painting that car or some other parts small parts are being manufactured at some other places or by some other person so they are actually carrying out a treatment or process on his goods and they are termed as job workers so this job work is actually a supply of service i am carrying out a process on some goods which are belonging to some other person but they will be this process is which i am conducting is a service that will be a supply of service if i am uh, taking out uh, if i am having the cloth of a person and i have to dye that into different colors or i have to uh, print in uh, that cloth into different designs print different designs on that particular cloth so that is a job work which that person is carrying on the manufacturer's goods and that will be a supply of service as per schedule 2 after uh, this para 4 i will see the queries so para 4 a says where goods forming part of the assets of a business are transferred or disposed of by or under the directions of the person carrying on the business so as no longer to form part of those assets such transfer or disposal is a supply of goods by the person if you remember in para uh, the para 1 which had we had referred of schedule 1 it said transfer or disposal permanent transfer or disposal of business assets uh, where itc has been taken so that was considered as supply even if it was done without consideration now here we are not talking about consideration because here we are assuming that that is a supply so if that transaction without consideration became a supply in para 1 it is a supply of good which has it has been classified as supply of goods as per para 4a of schedule 2 so it was that asset was part of the business and it has been transferred by the owner so that it does not form part of those assets that means it has been permanently transferred by the owner so that transfer or disposal is actually supply of goods it has been classified as supply of goods but here in this case we are covering transaction with consideration as well as without consideration also only classification is provided to you next is para 4b 4b says where by or under direction of the person carrying on the business goods held or used for the purposes of business are put to any private use or are used or made available to any person for use for any purpose other than the purpose of business the usage or making available of such goods is supply of services so if a person uh, who is manufacturing wooden furniture he has he is using one he has taken one chair at his home for using 
at his house then that becomes a supply of services so here we are actually taking out a product which is uh, we are actually taking out a good which is which was used for the purpose of business but now we are using it for some private purpose then that is considered as supply of services so see here we were considering in previous para we were considering it as supply of goods which we have transferred the goods permanently but when we are transferring the any uh, goods which are used for the business purpose for some private purpose then we are only using such goods so this is considered as supply of services then para 4c says that where any person ceases to be a taxable person that means he has stopped his business where a person has stopped his business so then in that case whatever assets were there in his business they shall be deemed to have been supplied by him immediately before he ceases to be a taxable person that means immediately before the day his business uh, is by uh, wound up on the day his business is uh, has been winded up before that date whatever stock he has with him that will be considered to be supplied by him so if farun a trader is winding up his business then whatever goods he has supplied shall be deemed to be supplied by him now this clause will not apply in case the business entire business is transferred to another person we are referring to uh, we are referring that business has been stopped that means he has stopped conducting the business he has discontinued his business and in that case Uh, whatever assets are left whatever stock has been left with him whatever assets have been left with him they will be considered to have been supplied by him and that supply will be considered as supply of goods but in case that business is sold or transferred as a going concern to another person that means that business has not discontinued actually it has been transferred to some other person and that person will continue this business from here onwards so in that case that will not be considered that those goods will not be considered to be supplied at all and there is no question of those that supply being supply of goods or supply of services the second case is business is carried on by a personal representative who is deemed that means that person that the only intention is that the business is not discontinued business has not been stopped by the person that person the business is still continuing either as a going concern to another person or by the personal representative of the taxable person that means maybe that person has died and his legal representative or personal representative is carrying on that business so that that could be a case which is covered here this will be considered in uh, this para 4c the supply will be considered as supply of goods para 5 has entries which are which were very controversial during the time of service tax and vat because both service tax and vat was being levied on these services and here in gst they have been specifically Uh, categorized as services so in para 5 we have i think six entries we have and all these are considered as services or they have been classified as services the first entry is renting of immovable property so if we are renting a commercial complex or we are renting our residential house or we are renting a property to an educational institution rent any religious place is being rented out then that is considered as supply of service that is classified as supply of service now comes para 5b that is construction of complex building civil structure etc now i had received a query regarding this from some of the student so uh, we'll cover it here so somebody has asked that uh, the uh, supply of a immovable property is not a supply as per gst because we have seen that only goods should be supplied and immovable property should not be supplied then why we are taking construction actually in construction when we are saying we are not actually supplying the good uh, the immovable property it is with relation to the construction of this immovable property the service which we are actually considering as supply now how do we uh, what do we actually categorize in para 5b is construction service or construction of a complex building or civil structure where the entire consideration has not been received after the completion of the building that means uh, suppose uh, let us take an example a person has is constructing a residential uh, society and it has uh, sold uh, the residential apartments to different sell, uh, to different buyers for some consideration now building is not yet complete 
from the uh, from the day it laid the foundation of that building till the date it gave the possession in between it has sold many units of its uh, society the apartments to different buyers so whatever units it has sold till the time of possession till the time of completion of the building that uh, and it has received consideration for that particular sale then that is not a sale of building that is actually a construction service which is which the builder is providing to the recipient <clears throat> for example rati builders has constructed individual residential units for an agreed consideration of 1.2 crores now it has sold the units the example which we were taking it has sold different units to different uh, buyers and some consideration it has received before completion of the building so even if the building was not complete it received some consideration and it gave those uh, uh, it sold those units to those buyers so entire consideration it has not received some part of the consideration it has received before completion then that will be considered as supply of the construction service and it is a service actually it is classified as service had it been the case where the entire consideration was received by the rati builders after the completion of the building now how do we uh the issue before the issuance of completion certificate the consideration should have been received so that means the building is not yet completed and consideration has been received and units have been sold so that is the construction service but this construction uh, is completed once the construction is completed and then if we are selling those units and that will be sale of building now this completion how do we determine that yes this completion is complete and uh, the building is completed now for that we have to receive the person or the builder has to receive a certificate from the chartered engineer or architect chartered architect whatever the authorities which are specified in pa para 2 from those authorities it has to receive a completion certificate after receiving the completion certificate if it it is receiving the consideration full consideration then that will not be a construction service that so no gst will be levied but if some consideration is partly received before completion then that will be construction service and it will be uh, subject to gst then we have uh, so the para para 5c says temporary transfer or permitting use or enjoyment of any intellectual property right so first first thing is that this transfer is temporary we are only permitting the use or enjoyment of the ipr or intellectual property right in india the commonly uh, common forms of ipr are the copyrights patents trademarks then industrial designs so if we are transferring these copyrights or these iprs temporarily we are allowing somebody to use these uh, copyrights or these uh, patents trademarks or industrial designs for a temporary for a um, short period or for a temporary purpose we have transferred their use and that is considered as a supply of service so transfer of ipr is a supply of service as per schedule then we come to para 5d which is development design programming customization adaptation upgradation enhancement and implementation of it software if you are providing any service relating to an it software regarding its development you are designing an it software it software or specifically customizing it for the purpose of a client you have specifically designed a, uh, a software for suiting his uh, specific needs or you have adapted an existing software for a customer or upgraded a software to a new version because new every day new technologies are coming or you have improved the software which is existing or implemented that software in a particular company then that particular service is also that is a service that is a supply of service as per the as per schedule to in para 5d example is so with our solutions develops an accounting software for a business firm so this is a customization we have developed a customized software for a particular business firm as per their needs a customized accounting software if we have developed then that is a supply of service this is an important service para 5e we will be discussing it in detail at the end with a uh, we have a clarification a detailed clarification on this and it is very uh, from today's point of view because there was a lot of there were a lot of doubts regarding this particular service this service is agreeing to obligation to refrain from an act or to tolerate an act or situation or to do an act now this 
I'm taking an example here, but we'll discuss it afterwards in detail. One cable operator has entered into an agreement with another cable operator that yes, you will not operate in my area and I will not operate in your area. So they both have agreed on a non-compete agreement. This is called non-compete agreement. They will not compete with each other. You don't uh, go into my area and I will not go into yours. And for that, the this is a, actually a consideration for each other. So both of them have agreed not to interfere in each other's areas. And this is a supply of service to by both of them. So one person is providing service to another of not entering into that person's area. This is the supply of service. Entry uh, para 5F says transfer of right to use any goods for any purpose, whether or not for a specified period for cash, deferred payment, or this is also a right to use. So we are giving any goods for using for using for a specified period in view of the consideration and we are not actually transferring the title of the goods that is the transfer of right to use it is a supply of service for example you are giving a machine on rent or machine on hire para 6a uh, provides that works contract is a composite service it is a service which is um, if we are providing the works contract service now we I think we discussed in some in any pre, in previous class in some of the previous classes that works contract service is uh, pertaining to immovable property in the GST law. Under GST law, whenever we are having a contract for construction, fabrication, erection, installation, anything relating to uh, you know within the purview of construction, so any service relating to construction, repair, modification of an immovable property, and where the uh, goods are also involved. So along with the service of construction, we are providing, we are transferring the property in goods also. That contract is called the works contract service. So in a works contract service, construction service is there. Plus we are transferring the goods also. We are using our equipment, our material also for that construction purpose. Only thing is that the, uh, the works contract service has to be provided in respect of an immovable property. We are constructing, we are renovating, we are um, maintaining or modifying, repairing any immovable property wherein the uh, prop goods also have been used by us. That is a supply of service. Para 6b says that you are supplying any food or any article for human consumption or any drink other than alcoholic liquor for human consumption. So in this, we are not... Uh, uh, why this exception has been provided because it is not under GST purview, alcoholic liquor for human consumption. So for this, whatever cash or consideration we are receiving, this particular supply is a supply of service. If we are supplying food articles, if we are supplying any um, drinks, any article for human consumption as part of service or as uh, or in any manner we are supplying those goods also, that means any food article or any uh, drinks we are supplying, then that will be considered as supply of service. Now, after that, we have to do these clarifications. But before that, let's see the queries. Should we remember schedule and para? Preeti, no need to remember schedule and para number. This is only for the reference. Same as the query of Aman also. And then Patro is saying meaning of section 71AA. Patro, this is you are referring to the section which I discussed in last class. Section 71AA is actually a clause of uh, supply of definition which provides that any service provided by a club to its members is a is a supply earlier this was i think you are asking it here because uh, you know that amendment it was there in schedule 2 earlier now it has been specifically provided in the definition of supply itself that any service provided any supply of goods or services by a club to its members is a supply why this clause was inserted or why there was a need to incorporate this clause in the law in the definition of supply because there is always a controversy or a doubt or debate that whether club and its members are two distinct persons. They were considered, considered as one and same by the court rulings. So in order to overcome or override those court rulings and in order to provide a specific provision for levy of GST by of, on the goods or services provided by a club to its members, clause AA has been incorporated to section 71, which provides that club and its members are two distinct persons, irrespective of any court ruling, any judgment, any decree which has been provided, which has been ruled. They are two distinct persons. Any supply between them by club to members or members to club 
will be considered as supply under GST also. So this is section 7.1 clause A. Divya is saying today, today's class is so heavy ma'am. Maybe Divya we have discussed so many concepts today but I would suggest that you revise these concepts after uh, this class so you will not, you will find them easy to retain. If job worker buys paint, paint for painting, this paint will be added to with job work or it will be supply from job work. This will be if job worker is using any goods for providing that service, that will be included in his value, in the value of his job work. I'm saying it is an exception of quid pro quo. I am uh, which particular case is this? Difference between works contract and job work. Works contract is with relating to an immovable property, whereas job work is only generally on movable goods you are providing these services. It will be on because something you are getting you goods, you are getting goods from your supplier or a person is giving you goods. So goods are always movable, whereas works contract is with regard to immovable property. So no need to remember schedule and para priti. And whether DC Nyokti is asking whether DCA is an agent, extension of loan is taxable. Where DCA is not an agent, extension of loan is taxable. Then who is taxable, whether DCA or principal? Where DCA is not an agent. Then loan is provided by DCA to the recipient. So therefore, DCA will be DCA is the supplier in this case, and recipient is, is the buyer who is buying goods and he is taking loan from DCA. So DCA will be giving uh, DCA is the supplier and the DCA is the supplier and that recipient is the recipient of this loan service. Surindran is asking how to write answers for theory questions. These questions we'll take afterwards. Uh, we have specific BOS for success session are conducted after, before, just before the examination. One month before the examination, we have BOS for success sessions which are conducted for each paper. So there are these type of queries, how to answer the questions, general queries which you have regarding the paper, they will be answered there. Don't worry. Okay, he's saying uh, para 5E is exception to quid pro quo. Ram is saying no, Ram. You will see we have a full explanation of this para 5E. Let me uh, come to that. So you will yourself understand that yes, it is not an exception to quid pro quo. You are getting something, then only it will become chargeable to tax. So first of all, there are two clarifications regarding Schedule 2. First clarification is clarification on taxability of tenancy rights against tenancy premium under GSP. See, there is a um, there is a transaction or you can say a arrangement, an agreement between a landlord and a tenant that the landlord will get the rent on uh, renting out his property to the tenant. Now, this tenant can also further so sell the or you can say transfer the tenancy rights which he has in his property when the in, in the property on which he has taken on rent to the new tenant how this transaction actually works uh, so suppose mr a is the landlord and he has given his property on rent to mr b now mr b has got the tenancy rights. This is a usually a system which works in many states that they give a lump sum amount at the beginning of the uh, this tenancy period, and the landlord gives their uh, the property or the house or whatever the building is there to the tenant on rent, and then tenant is sometimes also again transfers the rights to an, a new tenant. The, this is called outgoing tenant who is transferring the right to the new tenant. He transfers these tenancy rights to the new tenant under an agreement. Now, this form of leasing or renting of property is specifically declared as a service under Para 2. If you remember in Para 2, we had done leasing of land as well as leasing, leasing of building. So, this kind of renting is, is specifically declared as service and tax will be payable. On there was a doubt whether this second leasing that means the renting by outgoing tenant to the new tenant, whether this will be considered as supply or not. So because some people were, or some experts were of the view that since this transaction involves the execution of the documents which require registration and payment of registration fee and stamp duty, we have to pay stamp duty on this particular uh, the documents for which we are through which we are registering this transaction of renting. So this. This will not be included in supply. 
but no transfer of tenancy rights it is not a sale of building though we are execute we are paying stamp duty on it we are paying the registration fee for it but this is not a sale of land this is not a sale of building transfer of tenancy rights by an outgoing tenant to a new tenant against registration in the form of tenancy premium now what consideration it is getting it is the new tenant has to pay tenancy premium to the outgoing tenant then that is taxable so this what service is actually being provided here service is the service of surrendering the tenancy rights the outgoing tenant is surrendering his tenancy rights to the new tenant and it is receiving tenancy premium in lieu of that and that tenancy premium will be subject to gst now here one exemption is there the renting of resident now if landlord is giving his residential house to a person on rent and that person is an unregistered person he is an individual and he is he is unregistered or he is a sole proprietorship but that person is receiving that renting uh, residential house for his personal use then that service is exempt but this is covered under exemption from gst chapter i am only giving a reference that in case the landlord is giving on rent to the outgoing tenant his residential property for use as residence and this tenant is unregistered then that will be exempt from gst but this second leg of the transaction that is the trans surrender of tenancy rights to a new tenant by the outgoing tenant for tenancy premium in lieu of tenancy premium where the consideration is tenancy premium that will be subject to gst this has been clarified by way of a circular second circular in schedule 2 which is most important is the regarding the uh, para 5e that is agreeing to the obligation to refrain from an act or to tolerate an act or a situation or to do an act this particular service was there were lot of doubts lot of ambiguities regarding this particular service or this particular supply in this particular entry so this clarification as was issued in order to put uh, all these doubts to a rest so the expression of the para 5e is of schedule 2 says uh, agreeing to obligation to refrain from an act to tolerate an act or to do an act is considered as supply of service now this expression or this para has three limbs or three sections first is somebody is agreeing to the obligation to refrain from an act that means not to do an act not to uh, refraining from doing an act a particular act he is he has agreed he will not do second is agreeing to obligation to tolerate an act that means some person will do something which this person may not like but he is tolerating that okay i will tolerate this act and these all these three things are for consideration agreeing to the obligation to do an act so in third case he is agreeing to do something for other person uh, in lieu of the consideration so these are three limbs of this particular entry so uh, para 5 he says either you are agreeing to refrain from an act you are agreeing that you will not do a particular act or particular uh, action second is you will tolerate the act of the other person for a consideration or you will be doing something for the other person in lieu of the consideration then that activity will be covered under para 5e now for example we'll take example of each of them refraining and tolerating and then doing an act refraining example can be a builder has constructed a certain number of floors now he has agreed that suppose a builder has initially planned to construct 50 floors in a building but now he is only constructing 30 floors because the re residential buildings nearby or the societies nearby they have requested him that please don't construct after 30 floors because this will uh, this will not allow us to have any sunlight or this will uh, you know hinder our sunlight or our basic uh, amenities so for that he has agreed that yes he will not be constructing after 30 floors to the other societies or maybe municipal authorities have asked uh, have requested him not to construct beyond 30 floors though he is allowed to that he has a permission for that but then also uh, sorry he has allowed by municipal authorities he is requested by the uh, adjacent societies that don't construct after 30 floors because it is necessary for us to get the sunlight so for that the societies have paid some consideration to that building uh, building owner or builder and now this refraining from doing an act now he is builder is not doing any act builder is not constructing the building after 30 floors so he is refraining from constructing next 20 floors 
and this refrainment from and from this act is getting him some consideration so this becomes a supply of service under para 5e second could be an industrial unit is there it is construct it is working from 9 to 5 but a nearby school approaches that industrial unit and they say that please stop your industrial activity for just one hour 9 to 10 because we have some meditation for our students being conducted during that time or it disturbs our students so for that one hour if you don't uh, you stop your manufacturing activity you do not con undertake your manufacturing activity because it creates so much noise so we will be paying you this much consideration so this is in this and this industrial unit agrees to that so what this industrial unit is actually doing it is refraining from doing an act it is not actually doing anything but it is getting a consideration from not for not doing an act from for refraining to do an act so it is actually having an obligation to refrain from the act of not conducting the manufacturing activity for one hour and in that in return it is getting a consideration second is tolerate an act now you are not doing an act you are not refraining from doing an act you just tolerating an act of the other person for example a shopkeeper he allows a hawker to uh, to post uh, to operate from the common pavement in front of his shop so he has installed his uh, hawker has installed his goods in front of his in front of his shop on the pavement and for that pu uh, purpose this hawker is giving him some consideration that yes you please allow me to set up my goods or my uh whatever product he is selling in front of his shop so this is he is not doing anything shopkeeper is not doing anything shopkeeper is not refraining from doing anything he is only tolerating the act of the hawker similarly an rwa if he is allowing the school to uh, conduct the morning prayers in lieu of the consideration by the school then that is also an act of tolerating an act so it is tolerating the loud speakers which are being uh loud speakers which are being used by the schools in the morning hours for a agreed sum this is tolerating in a to do an act now an industrial unit though is it is not under any legal com uh, legal compulsion but it is actually uh using some machinery or some equipment so that less hazardous chemicals or less hazardous emissions are there from its industrial unit for this an rwa has agreed to pay a consideration to that industrial unit so it is doing an act for a consideration it has it has agreed to do an act for a consideration that yes though it is not under an obligation to do, do that but still it has agreed that okay i will not uh, i will use such equipments that will not uh, so that my uh, you know hazardous chemicals are not emitted from my factory in order to fall in any of these three clauses which we have done first of all there should be an agreement so we, we can say a supply will be a supply of service under para 5e only when either these three it falls under any of these three clauses refraining from an act tolerating an act or doing an act plus there should be a expressed agreement written or oral agreement should be there then consideration should also flow from one person to another so for doing this or for refraining from doing it this or tolerating an act person should get some consideration also so we in all the examples we had seen some consideration was there so because now uh, in this framework of para 5e whether we have this clarification has clarified certain activities certain amounts whether they fall within the purview of para 5e or not this is what clarification is providing and these are important because they were very uh, ambiguous before the issue of this clarification so first is the liquidated damages will be doing liquidated damages is it is a compensation which is given it is a cash compensation as per the definition it is a cash compensation which is given for breach of the contract so if somebody is not completing or not complying with his contract then the contract stipulates that in the event of breach of the contract the Part one party will give so much amount or a specified amount to the other party. The aggrieved party will receive the stipulated amount for not complying, for not meeting the contract, for not performing the contract. So, will this and those damages are called liquidated damages. That compensation is called liquidated damages. That if this contract is not uh, performed, if this contract is breached, then the aggrieved party will get thousand. Grows as compensation. Suppose this is the contract. So, will this compensation be considered as a consideration for tolerating an act of non-performance of the contract? We have to see whether these liquidated damages fall within the 
purview of para 5e tolerating an act tolerating an act of non performing the contract so the circular clarified that no this will not be considered as a consideration liquidated damages are paid to the aggrieved person so that the person can get a uh, person can be you know some way he can be compensated for his loss but the intention of the contract is not that the person that the contract should be breached performance is the essence of the contract we have entered into a contract so that the contract can be complied with the one person can uh, perform the act for the other person under the contract we have not entered into contract so that the person breaches the contract and the aggrieved party gets the compensation no that was not the intention so these liquidated damages are a, only a compensation they are not a consideration received for tolerating the breach or tolerating the non performance of the contract they are payments for not tolerating the breach they are because why these uh, this clause was initially incorporated in the contract so that in case the contract is not performed the contract is not complied with then this damage or compensation will be received by the aggrieved party but intention was not that the a person should not comply with the contract and the person will get the compensation no so this cannot be considered as a consideration liquidated damages or penalty they were not they were never intended to be achieved they only were given to compensate the aggrieved party so this cannot be considered as a consideration and this is not covered in para 5e tolerate an act clear some examples suppose uh, some damage has been there to a property or uh, unauthorized use of trade name or copyright is there for that compensation has been received by the aggrieved party then that will not be that liquidated damages will not be considered as a consideration for tolerating an act it will not be considered as a supply but for example a, a house has been constructed with delay then pen some penalty has been stipulated that if it is constructed after a delay of some, this much months then uh, you have to pay a penalty so that penalty amount is not a consideration it is only a liquidated damage and that will not be considered as a supply suppose a sale agreement agreement to sale has been entered into and some token money was given in the beginning but that sale did not fructify so afterwards the uh, the seller has forfeited the token money given by the buyer so that forfeited earnest money will not be a consideration for the supply of uh, agreeing to tolerate an act that will not be considered as a supply it is only a liquidated damage it is only a compensation for the breach of the agreement to sell so i hope this is clear liquidated damage we'll take the queries at the end because we have already exceeded by some time from the stipulated time now this circular has also clarified taxability of some other transactions which whether they can be included in para 5e or they cannot be included first is the check dishonor dishonor or fine or uh, check dishonor fine or check dishonor penalty so if any bank or any supplier is levying any fine for dishonor of the check then also then that will also not be considered as a supply for uh, consideration for where fine or penalty is the consideration here also the same logic applies that this was never the intention uh, for uh, uh, levying the fine or keeping the fine that the person should dishonor the check should be dishonor no the, this has been done to ensure the performance of the contract this has been done to ensure that the check is honored or the person ensures that the money is there so that his check is honored so the whatever fine or penalty is being levied for this honor of the check that will not be included in para 5e penalty imposed for violation of laws now if you are going on road and you have crossed the you have jumped the red light you are imposed a fine of rupees 1000 2000 or whatever is the amount so is that 1000 a consideration for your jumping the red light will that be a supply will that be a so th because the traffic police person is tolerating your act of jumping the red light no this is not the intention penalty is not levied or fine is not levied for you to allow to do that act he is not allowing you to do that act he just want you not to do that act intention is that you should not do that so that will be so this penalty imposed for violation of laws is not a consideration for tolerating the act of violating the law no it is not the case so this will not be a supply here then we have the next is bond amount by employee now generally when companies recruit a person they spend so much on the recruitment drive and they don't want the person to go away within few months so they uh, many a times they ask the employee the newly recruited employee to enter into a contract with the company 
wherein the contract stipulates that if the person leaves the company before a stipulated period suppose a company says if you leave the company before one year you have to pay a bond amount of 2 lakh rupees or you have to pay a bond amount of your 6 months salary so that is the company asks the employee to enter into a bond into a legal obligation into a contractual obligation that yes that person cannot leave the company before one year otherwise he has to pay the bond amount that may be any amount so does that bond amount uh, signifies consideration for that employee or that company to tolerate the early leaving of the employee no this is not the intention of the company company does not want that employee to leave early they want that employee to be there because they have spent so much sometimes they spend on their training initially orientation during orientation period companies spend so much on the training of the employees and after and those employees if they leave after the training immediately after one month's training they leave the job so that is not the intention they want to retain that employee and that is why they have inserted this bond amount clause and therefore this bond amount paid by the employee is not a consideration for the uh, tolerating an act of the employee by the company. Company is not tolerating the act of employee of leaving early. This is not a supply. So this would not be covered under para 5e. Next is late payment surcharge or fee. Now when you, fee, you uh, pay your electricity bills telephone bills, water bills, then usually with those bills, uh, you get a late fee, a late payment surcharge or late fee in case you pay them after the due date. Now here, here is a, there is a difference in this case. There is a main supply that is supply of electricity, water or supply of tele telecommunication services in case of telephone bills. While paying that bills, it is a common practice or it is very common that people tend to forget their last dates and they pay after that date. So this late fee or late charge is not for is for compensating that late uh, late payment. So a main supply is there. Main supply is supply of water. You have paid the water bill on after the stipulated date. So company has stipulated some amount, some charges for the late payment. So there is a principal supply supply is uh, the supply of water or supply of electricity or supply of telecommunication services apart from that there is an ancillary service that in case you pay late you can pay 100 rupees per day charges or 10 rupees per day charges so these late payment fees the circular clarifies that this is this can be considered as a service of tolerating or agreeing to tolerate the late payment and this is an ancillary service. When we do the composite supply concept, this will be considered as a composite supply. Main services, supply of electricity, supply of uh, telecommunication service, ancillary services, late, uh, agreeing to tolerate the late payment by the customer. So these charges will be included in the principal supply. Hope this is clear to you all. Next is fixed charges for power. Fixed charges for power. Now these power generating companies they charge from the uh, state electricity boards and state electricity boards also charge from the individual customers two types of charges they take one is the fixed charges for power another is the variable charges fixed charges are not related to the uh, units which a person is consuming or the units which a state electricity board is actually consuming they are uh, they are a fixed amount that Generally, it so happens that a particular till a particular unit, these power generating companies they fix the amount that for two hundred units you have to pay a fix of this uh, fixed amount of this much units, this much rupees, and a variable amount is also there for per unit consumption. So fixed amount has to be paid whether you consume any electricity or you do not consume any electricity or you consume electricity up to a particular point or not. So those fixed charges are irrespective of your consumption. Now, whether these fixed charges will be considered as a supply or not. So, yes, they will be considered as a supply of because they are actually, they are, it is a charge for tolerating enough act for not complying with the, uh, for not uh, meeting the, you can say, um, they are not, they are the charges for not meeting the uh, basic minimum uh, limit because you have to consume till 2000, 200 units. So you have to, for 200, for um, consuming 200 units, you have to pay a charge of rupees, suppose 500 rupees as the fixed charge which has to pay, which has to be paid, either you consume it or not. 
so this to this uh, 500 rupees will be included in your consideration and they will be considered as a supply so both variable component as well as the fixed component will be considered as a supply and gst would be levable on that next is the cancellation charges now cancellation charges are the uh, charges which we levy for suppose we have booked a particular flight and at the very last moment we have to cancel our flight so some cancellation charges are charged by the airline sometimes entire amount is forfeited as in the name of the cancellation charges but what the circular clarifies is that these charges are actually because the uh, the airlines has specifically reserved a particular air uh, you know some services for you it has reserved a seat for you until the last moment so these charges are for that particular for providing you services when you are uh, coming to the airport you are uh, you know you are uh, waiting in the lounge then you are taking some services from the uh, this uh, particular uh, airlines so these services this company is actually reserving for you now but at the last moment you cancelled that flight and you did not avail these services but the company had scheduled that services for you in some uh, suppose you have reserved you have booked a train ticket and at the uh, and you cancelled it afterwards so there are some cancellation charges which are being allocated for that particular cancellation now you have to uh, so those cancellation charges are actually for the services which that particular railway company or railways has reserved for you they have uh, they have actually slotted those services to be provided to you and in case you cancel that then those cancellation charges are actually a consideration for these services to be uh, which were to be provided to you so this cancellation fee is a cost involved in making arrangement for that particular service which you had actually agree, uh, you had expected to be provided so those cancellation charges are actually a consideration for the services which uh, were scheduled to be provided to you but which could not be actually provided so these last three payments which we are receiving on these last three transactions late payment surcharge or fee fixed charges for power and cancellation charges they are included under para 5p they are considered as supply they are considered as consideration for supply okay uh, now uh, we have now schedule 3 but before moving to schedule 3 i think today we will not be able to do schedule 3 we will do it in next class but let's see if any queries are pending before that. Ma'am, please explain as landowner, landlord is the owner of the property, then how tenancy premium paid by new tenant will be income of the outgoing tenant. Actually, land, uh, this tenancy uh, setup is that after giving, after the landlord has given this uh, property on rent to the tenant, on generally it is called a pagri, pagri system, that on a payment of a lump sum amount, this, amount, this property has been given on rent to the tenant tenancy rights have been given to the tenant and this tenant sorry, has surrendered his tenancy rights to a new tenant for the payment of the tenancy premium so sometimes this landlord is given some share also in that tenancy premium but the surrender of tenancy rights by the tenant by the uh, outgoing tenant to the new tenant that would be subject to gst whether hawker is liable for gst for consideration paid to shopkeeper for toleration GST uh, Mohammed will be paid by the supplier. So here the sub service is provided by the shopkeeper who is tolerating the act of the hawker to establish, uh, to uh, you know, set up his goods in front of his shop. So this will be paid by the shopkeeper uh, on the service which it is providing to the hawker. Is there any negative marking in MCQs in May 24 exam? Yes, uh, no, negative marking will not be there. All MCQs will be case scenario based MCQs. There will be no negative marking. Ma'am, refrain tolerate agreeing should be legal for getting considering. Yes, obviously, this should be a legal act for which you're doing. But um, actually, if you see under GST, uh, when I, if we reconsider it, it's not that everything which is legal should be taxed, which is a sub something which is a supply has to be taxed. So, um, in some of these states, if you see that um, the betting, gambling, lottery, they may not be legal, but you, uh, something which is not legal cannot escape the net of taxation. This is the general principle which is followed. If at the last, uh, whether GST application on electricity consumption, GST is not applicable on electri electricity consumption, it is exempted from, electricity is exempted from GST. But this is the principle which we had discussed. 
since electricity is exempt so any charges which have to be included in the electricity uh, charges they will also be exempt that is the uh, gst liability or gst payment regarding gst payment but yes this will be considered as a supply so gst electricity is a supply but it is exempted from gst gst is not uh, applicable for electric power yes you are correct raj it is not applicable only thing is that yes it will it is a supply but it is not subject to gst Ma'am, there is no practical problem or this paper is fully theory. No, this is not a fully theory paper. There are practical problems. If you see test your knowledge section of the chapter, you will see that yes, DST has uh, practical problems. The concepts which we are doing seems to be very theoretical because we are not doing any questions. But we will be doing questions at the end of the uh, these classes. We have specifically dedicated sections for the problem solving. There you will find that we have full-fledged computational problems. Where you have to compute GST, you have to compute input tax credit, value of supply, and then you have to determine time of supply. So you have application-based questions as well as computational questions in GST. It is not fully theory. Don't think at all that GST is a theory paper. Uh, I think with that, all the queries have been answered. No negative marking that I have already told you. Yes. So with this, we... Ma'am, security premium ka concept samjha dije. Let's say security premium, security deposit. I think Gunjan, you are asking regarding consideration which we discussed in last class. I think so. Security deposit is uh, this is a uh, you know kind of consideration which is received, or this is a kind of splitting the consideration which can be there. If we have received any security deposit at the beginning of the contract. And I, suppose I am a supplier and I have received a security deposit and I have promised to the my recipient that at the end of the contract, I will return this security deposit as it is to you. It is a refundable security deposit. Then that security deposit will not be considered as a consideration. But in case I had, we have an agreement that yes, 1000 rupees I would receive as a security deposit today. And at the end of the contract, whatever consideration was due, suppose 10,000 was my consideration. So only 9,000 total I have to pay and 1,000 the security deposit will be applied as a consideration. That means that will also be used in payment of consideration. So in that case, this 1,000 will be considered as a consideration if it is not refundable as it is at the end of the contract. Um, again, okay. So I hope all the queries have now been answered. In case any of you have any query, please ask and so that we can wind up the session after that. Regarding the, uh, I would like to tell you, Achha, we have one more class for supply and this class will not be on in the evening. It will be on uh, Wednesday morning. That means on 7th morning, 7 to 9.30, this class will be held and we will be completing chapter of supply in that session. We'll try to cover some uh, small practical questions also in that session. So be prepared. I would request all of you to go to the earlier sessions also and have a complete idea till that uh, point we have covered in this class. We'll have some questions at the end of the session on Wednesday morning. After that, you will be having your uh, next chapter that is charge of GST. So schedule will be hosted on the website. You can refer that. But this chapter will be completed on Wednesday morning. So in case you have any more queries, please uh, let us let me know. Otherwise, with this, we come to an end of the session. Thanks for the patient listening. Thank you. Yes.